Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Bikes for Death podcast. As always, my name is Patrick, and I am your host, and I'm excited to be back in your podcasting feed with another great episode. I apologize. It's been a couple weeks since I've released an episode, and that's partially due to the fact that I've been super busy getting ready for Central Texas Showdown and getting registration open for East Texas Showdown and had some scheduling conflicts with other guests. And so anyway, my apologies, but I'm excited to be back and I'm excited to bring you a chat with today's guest, who is Jen Kelly. Now, you may not have heard of Jen Kelly before, and that is because she is new to the world of bikepacking and bikepack racing. She picked up a bike four years ago and just started riding further and further and further and really learned that she loved it. And she entered her first bikepacking race this summer, which was the Great American Wheelman Race which is a brand new race. So I was excited to uh, learn more about that event. And she ended up coming in first female and fourth overall. And then six weeks after that, she signed up for the Big Sky Spectacular in Montana, which is a 900 mile bikepacking race. And uh, since recording this, we actually found out that she they adjusted the times and she actually was the overall winner of that event. And then just five days, I think it was five days after she finished that event, she turned around and started the Montana bike odyssey, which is a 1,750 mile bikepacking race in Montana. And she was the overall winner of that event as well. And so this was her first ever season as a bike pack racer, and she has done insanely well. And it was really exciting to hear her experience, her journey, why she got into bike packing, and how she was able to train and prepare for such an impressive summer. It was also really surprising to find out that she is a professional poker player. And uh, she actually put her career on hold to focus on uh, riding her damn bike. So really fascinating conversation, really impressive efforts from Jen. And it was so much fun to talk to her. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see what she does in the future. So that is what we have on today's episode. And I'm excited for you to hear it. But before we get to it, let's take a moment to thank the people that made today's episode possible, starting with our latest patrons. Unfortunately, this week we don't have any, but that's okay. If you enjoy these episodes and you want to support this show, a great way to do that is over at patreon.com forward slash bikes or death. Next up, I just want to send out a reminder that East Texas Showdown 2025 registration opens this Friday, September 27th at high noon. And you can find all of the information about that event and registration information at TexasShowdownSeries.com. Real quick, I will tell you that East Texas Showdown 2025 will be held from March 27th through the 30th. We have three route options for you to choose from. The showdown is 400 miles. The slowdown is 280 miles. And we have a non-competitive bikepacking ride called the lowdown that you can do. It's only 165 miles. And it's a great introduction to the sport of bikepacking. Uh, a ride with your friends, whatever you want it to be, but it's not a race. It's just for fun to go out there and ride your damn bike any way you want to. Uh, it is an absolute blast, and I've been blown away by the reception that we have gotten for uh, these Showdown Series races. This year, we have 250 spots available. Last year, we had 250 as well, and it sold out. So if you are interested in joining us in the East Texas Piney Woods in 2025, please don't sleep on this one. Make sure you get ready, ask your mom for permission, call in sick to work, sign up for high-speed internet access, whatever you need to do, but be ready to register on September 27th at high noon over at bikereg.com. And we will see you in the East Texas Piney Woods in March.
All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast today. I've got Andrew from Livesin. And Andrew, I know that versatility and owning less so you can live more is a big part of your ethos over at Livesin. And I'm wondering, like, how do you design products that are in line with that ethos? Well, we started out with a set of principles that I wrote down at the very beginning with the intention of putting some guardrails on each side so that ideally, if we followed this set of principles, we would end up with products that were high quality, that lasted a long time, and that were very versatile. And that versatility piece is really important. Like I said, if you want to own less stuff and go live more and live a well-worn life, then you need products that do more than one thing well, right? Obviously, we're not making mountaineering gear. That's highly specialized. We're building products for everyday life for active people. And to us, um, and probably interesting to your retailers is we're based in Bentonville, Arkansas, and our entire team either mountain bikes or commutes by bike, you know, or, or does something on two wheels. And so biking and, and versatility and the ability to ride a bike and then get off and be back in your office is a really important part of our principles too, or where we design from. Yeah. I love that, man, because like one thing I talk about on the podcast is there's no such thing as a dress code for cycling, right? And I think that the idea of needing to wear a specific set of clothing to be a member of a community or to go on a bike ride is is kind of limiting. And I really like the idea of just wearing the clothes that you have that are functional clothing, hopping on your bike and going for a ride. Um, you can go from the office to a ride, out to a beer with your friends, like whatever it is. And I love the functionality and how that really reduces the barrier to entry of like going to ride your bike, like just like you were when you're a kid, like what you're wearing is fine, but not all clothing will fit that bill. And that's something I think Livson does really well. And um, I'm all for any clothing that is versatile, sustainable, and allows you to go ride your damn bike anytime. One of the features that would be relevant to a lot of people listening to this podcast is a reflective strip that's on the inside of our pants leg on most of our men's styles that you can roll up the leg, pull the strip out, button it to the outside, and it's got a reflective strip down it for higher visibility at night if you're riding your bike. And one of our principles is to integrate features subtly. And so instead of calling that out on your pant leg when you're not using it, that button on the outside is color matched and very subtle. And I think that's a big part of versatility and then therefore a part of sustainability as well is that if we integrate all these technical features subtly, then you're more likely to wear that product more and more, wear those pants every single day into the office and all those things. Then if you if all those technical features, the gusseted crotch, the articulation in the knees were contrast and highlighted and overly technical looking, that actually limits, I think, utility. Because then you're kind of owning a look if you're going to wear that product. Whereas, like you said, ours generally look like normal pants or normal shorts. But with that stretch, with that mobility, with that articulation and with those features, you can jump on the bike and go do more than just a commute. You can go shred 30 miles and you'll still be wearing the same pants, maybe with a little bit more dirt on them. Yeah, a little more dirt, maybe a lot more dirt. Uh, dirt don't hurt, you know. I love that, Andrew. That is so cool. And uh, dear listener, if you want to check out the full line of products that Livesin has to offer, you can go to Livesin.com. And if you'd like to save 10% on your order, Livesin has a special code just for BOD listeners. Use code BOD10 at checkout and then go ride your damn bike. Thanks for coming on the podcast today, Andrew. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, ching, ching, ching. The bills have been paid, and now it is time to get to my chat with Jen Kelly. But first, let's have my friend Miles Arbor kick it off with the Bikes Are Death theme song. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. You, you asked whether I had listened to the podcast. I've probably listened to about 40 hours with you over the course of the summer on different trips. Oh, um, wow. And yeah, you've been a good friend in my ear and your oh. guests. Yeah. 
I remember okay. I was having like a struggle segment in the Appalachians and I was listening to you and Jenny Tuff. And she was saying, yeah, I like to listen. You know, it helps me remember that I'm not alone out here. I'm not the only person who's gone and done crazy things on a bicycle. And I was like, yeah, Jenny, it feels really good to hear your voice right now. And remember that this is okay. And people have survived this plenty of times. Yeah. People have done hard things before. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jenny Tuff, that's a great one to listen to for a little oh, bit man. of inspiration. She's, she's incredible, yeah. Yeah. What What was your favorite ep episode that you've listened to so far? The most recent exciting episode for me was the one with uh, the, I can't remember his, Weston in the book, and Philip maybe is his real you name? You nailed it. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, and me and my friend both downloaded that audio book and started listening to it together after listening to that episode. Because oh, um, cool. I feel like that episode is like the far outlier of being in it for the adventure and the experience and not knowing or caring about logistics really at all. Like, yeah, yeah. Every, the details all work themselves out. We're just going out there to see what happens. Yeah, Philip, what an interesting, interesting guy. I really enjoyed getting a chance to uh, meet him and hang out with him. He's uh, everything I was hoping for and more for sure. Uh, yeah. Are you enjoying that book? I'm loving it. Yeah. I've only, I'm really bad at listening to audiobooks, So I've only made it through about the first three chapters, but the next time I'm like on a long road trip or a bike ride, it's in my library now. Yeah. Yeah. Jet That's... does a really good job of reading it where it is, you know, and Philip mentioned this in that interview that he reads it in a way that's conversational where it doesn't feel totally scripted. And like you're hearing someone recite something. Cause that's one of my big troubles with audiobooks in general. I tend to tune out because it, it's just too boring. Like the, drone of the hearing someone read something just doesn't do it for me the way that podcasts do but i think mm. i'll be able to finish this book on audio interesting i have a different experience but so you really gravitate towards like more of a dynamic conversational type experience when you're uh, out on the bike what do you listen to when you're out there what what do you listen to to get you fire up and you know help the miles pass by a ton of music and often like one or two playlists just on repeat all day. Um, so yeah, I can, I can show you my Spotify playlist. That would be the most direct dance. Yes. But yeah, music, I'm like 80% music, 10% podcast, 10% silence or something like that when I'm out riding. Oh, wow. So you're having something in for a majority Almost of the time. Always. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff. Well, Jen Kelly, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you well, coming on to chat with me today. I'm excited to, uh, you've had an, an epic summer, epic, epic yeah. summer. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, I kind of can't believe it myself. It played out incredibly. Yeah. I mean, I guess like right off the bat, just to kind of introduce uh, you to the audience and like this big summer that you had, uh, why don't you just, you know, tell us what, I, I, I'm aware of three big events that you've done. So maybe there's been more, but I'm aware of three big events that you've done. Okay, so what were those? Yep, you've got it. Those are the big three. So um, in mid-June, late June, I took off on the Great American Wheel Race. This was the first year for this event. It was 3,600 miles from Seattle, Washington to Washington, D.C., using as much of the rail trail network as possible. So it was like almost half of it was on car-free bike path. Um, and then using gravel roads as much as possible after that so that we were not exposed to high-speed traffic. Um, and that was my first big bikepacking experience. I had done some at home to train up for it and definitely my first big bikepacking race. And I had a blast and loved it and was so sad about it ending uh, that before it ended, Ended, I went ahead and committed to riding the Big Sky Spectacular, mm -hmm. uh, which is a 900-mile loop uh, out of Bozeman, Montana, that started August sometime? Early August? August 19th. Okay, mid-August, yeah. According uh, to my notes. Yeah, and then completely unplanned, I got home from that and was sad that the se season was ending and saw a notice on Instagram that the Montana Bike Odyssey was starting in five days. And it took me about a day to move from like wondering whether I was up for that to deciding that I was up for that. And so I just turned it around super fast and headed back to Bozeman for a 1700 mile loop. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that is so wild, Jen. That is insane. Like, I, I, I would have assumed, I did assume leading into this conversation that you had planned out this big epic summer. But what really transpired is you had so much fun on the first one, you were just looking for ways to keep feeding the fire. Yeah, I've been, I've only been riding bikes seriously for about four years now. And last fall, in the fall of 23, I had kind of not really done anything in the season and had been busy with work in the summer and not riding bikes enough. And I said, I need a big goal. And I chose the goal of competing in the 24 hour time trial in Borrego Springs this fall. So I said, okay, I've got a year. I want to get really trained up. And I gave myself a sabbatical from work and decided all I was going to do was ride bikes and eat and recover. Um, and, and sometime over the winter is when I realized that the wheel race was really an exciting adventure that I wanted to see if I could do. And I joined that Facebook group kind of tentative and not knowing if I was up for it or not. And one of my friends, Adam Kidd, posted in that group and said, hey, everybody that's in this group and hasn't registered, what are you waiting for? Like, what, what would be the magic that would make you ready for this since you're obviously interested? And I said, you know what, w what am I waiting for? Like, I'm not ready. I don't know how to do this yet, but I've still got some months to figure it out and let's go. Um, yeah. And yeah, that, that led me, I had probably done like two or three motel overnights off my bike before, but I had never camped off the bike. And I actually didn't start camping off the bike kind of until the Big Sky Spectacular um, I only had an emergency bivy for the wheel race and only needed it twice. So it was pretty okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just, I realized, you know, I don't think anybody ever feels really ready for their first one of these big adventures. There's so many things to learn and so much training to feel like you've done. And it's just a really big thing to feel like you're ready for. Um, yeah. And I realized that I, I was as ready as I was going to be. And it was time to, go and see what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you can ever fully, even if you've done one before, I still think there's got to, I mean, there's so many question marks from wildlife to weather, to mechanicals, to physical ability, mental preparedness. I mean, there's so much that goes into actually being ready. I don't think you can fully know until you just get out there, you know, you're yeah, not going to, you're not right. going to know for sure. And that's part of the fun. I realized when I like look at future goals that the goals that I'm sure I could do are a lot less appealing. Hmm. You know, part of the magic in these big ambitions for me is having that question mark in my head of, am I up for this? Can I do this thing? Yes. I think that that's exactly it. It is the question mark that that I think makes people want to keep signing up for these kinds of events. I mean, there's other stuff too, but you want to answer that question, can I do this? And there's only one yeah. way to find out. And it's a big question. You know, it's a lot bigger yeah. than... I mean, you know, we're all on our own journey and a hundred mile bike race is huge if it's the first one you've ever done. But if you've done 10 or 20 of those, you're like, okay, you know, what's the next big iteration of this? How do I an keep answering that question? Can I do this? Can my body do this? You know, and that is, I think that's the appeal. And I think that's what keeps progressing this sport and kind of endurance sports forward is that human you know, interest, that desire to keep answering the question of like, can I do this? Yeah. So yeah, it feels I, real good to surprise yourself with those answers. <laughs> You're like, oh, I can do this. Yeah, I did it. It worked. Yeah. I'm alive. Yeah. Yeah, you have. Yeah, we're gonna get. Uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about all of your events from this summer because uh, you did do it. You did it, and you did very well in all the events. I'm curious, uh, just getting to know you a little bit more and your background, uh, where you live, and what you do for work. You mentioned that you took a sabbatical. So, yeah, what's going on with your work life right now? Yeah. So for most of my adult life, I've been a professional poker player. Um, Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So that's something that gives a tremendous amount of freedom. You know, I, I operate on my own terms and I decide when I want to work and how much I want to work. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that's how I was able to give myself a sabbatical. <laughs> Just said, all right, I'm not, we're going to live off savings for a while and we'll see how that all plays out. You know, I'll have to work again eventually, but for now oh, I'm not wow. going to think about that stuff. So talk, speaking of a personality who likes to take chances and big risk, um, that sounds like it's just maybe, yeah, part of your personality and within your wheelhouse. 
Uh, it's interesting. I regard like, so there's two kinds of people who get drawn to playing poker, analytical people who don't care about the gamble or the excitement of it at all. And gamblers who want to get lucky. And for the most part, the professionals tend toward that first category. And I definitely have a little bit of the gamble in me. I've always been cautious in my professional life to make sure I wasn't, to make sure my, my decisions were driven by rationality and analysis and not driven by that fun of like winging it and seeing if it'll work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I do have a little bit of the, the gamble in me, but that's actually not what makes for a good poker player. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a little familiarity with this. I used to play poker pretty seriously. Um, you know, I read a bunch of books and, uh, you know, had a bunch of house games and played online a ton. Um, yeah. and it's always been, yeah. Uh, poker is just super interesting to me. Do you play, uh, like Texas Hold'em? The, my favorite game is, is pot limit Omaha. Um, okay. I don't know. So that it's similar to Texas Hold'em, except you've got four cards and you have to use exactly two from your hand along with what's on the board to make your hand at showdown. Um, so it's just, it's kind of like, uh, it's it's kind of like basically a more complicated form of Hold'em that allows for more, it, it, it makes more room for the skill edge to show up. It's also a great game for gamblers because um, usually the edges are, are smaller, like in Instead of having in Hold'em, I might have like an 80% edge over you when the money gets in if if I've outmaneuvered you. In Omaha, it tends to be closer, like 60-40. So the gamblers get to win a lot of big pots and and it kind of makes it harder for them to see how much they're losing over the long run. Wow. Um, yeah, but I've always preferred cash games to tournaments. You can come and go at will in a cash game, whereas in a tournament, you have to stay and keep playing until the end of the tournament or until you get knocked out. Yeah. Um, and I how started with been... online... It's a oh long yeah, time. I guess you're yeah, answering that. Yeah, I'm 41. Yeah, I'm 41. So I've been playing. I probably started playing before I was 21. Um, and during college, I learned how to play online poker, uh, and I studied computer science and philosophy, and had some jobs as a programmer early on. And at that time, I was making better money with online poker than I could being a Bay Area programmer. That is no longer anywhere close to true. I'm definitely making less than I would if I had a normal job, but it's really fun to have the amount of freedom that I get with poker. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. So, um, how do you like, what is a day in the life when you're actively working? Um, do you, you, you said you live in park city, Utah. Mm -hmm. I, I actually grew up Mormon. I'm not Mormon anymore, but I grew up Mormon yeah. and I, I I never lived in Utah, even though that's the motherland. But, you know, when I think of more uh, Utah, I don't think of um, casinos. Do they even have yeah. casinos there? Um, yeah, there's Wendover, Nevada is like a, an hour and a half outside of Salt Lake. Um, and it's the Nevada state line. And so mm. there's um, like a fairly booming, tiny gambling town there with a couple of different giant hotels with poker rooms and casinos. Um, and so for live poker, that's where I go. Um, and I would do, you know, the living in a resort town, it gets kind of overrun on the weekends. And so when, when my partner is also a poker player, so we we're doing this stuff together. So when we were playing live a lot, we would play in park city all week and then go and hammer it hard over the weekend in Wendover, uh, and put in not quite full-time hours, but, you know, put in like maybe 30 hours of work over a three day stay over there. Um, and then there's also online poker got a lot worse in the U S because of, uh, regulations. Um, but there's still some sort of gray market online poker available, uh, in all States. And then a bunch of individual States have fully legal and above board online gambling. Um, so like the last big round of work I did, I was bringing my skills up so that I was able to beat global pot limit Omaha fields. Uh, on those gray market sites, which is kind of hard because a lot of people basically you want to play against lazy Americans. You don't want to play against highly motivated people from rural India where, you know, the like they can make a, a king's wage by beating very small stakes online. Yeah. Um, and so the motivation for the global field to improve is massive. And the motivation for Americans to improve is just not that big. Like you are better off getting a normal job if you've got some brains and want to apply yourself 
like poker is not the way to make money in the US. Um, <laughs> but I was able to get my, you know, I was able to beat those games again uh, last year and then I haven't played for a year now. Oh, you've been off for a whole year. Well, close, right? I, I think I think I started my sabbatical around September, October is when I decided that I was going to focus fully on riding bikes. Wow. Yeah. What's the most money you've made in a day or a sitting? 10K-ish. Okay, so you're not playing like the super crazy high stakes. I'm not playing massive. No, I'm mostly playing 2-5 no limit. So I'm usually buying in for $1,000 at a time. Um, And the 10, you know, it might have been an 8K day, something in that vicinity. And that's probably like a 24 plus hour session of playing in really good games and getting really lucky. Wow. Uh, how do you prevent yourself from going on tilt? And I guess describe what going on tilt means because this is a bike podcast and we're talking about yeah. poker. <laughs> yeah. Go- going on tilt is um, losing your rational decision making power because of frustration at the results in the game. And you can see it happen to people. You can see someone like play conservatively, make reasonable decision after reasonable decision. And then something happens. They get very unlucky. They accidentally, you know, they've got Kings and the other person has aces and they're all in pre-flop. Something happens that just flips a switch for that person. And now all of a sudden they're involved in every hand, making massive bets and going bananas. Um, this is an interesting question. How do I prevent it? Um, I guess a lot of my time involved in poker has been learning how to take stock of myself and what am I doing and why am I making the decisions that I'm making. So as soon as I find myself making, I've always kind of got that third perspective active in my mind of like, what's motivating this? Are you, do you really think this is the best play right now? Or do you just hope that you can do something wild and get away with it? Um, and so when I notice that I'm trying to do something wild and get away with it, I take a break and, you know, try to sit back down. And if I can't get out of that mindset, I quit. Um, I've also always had a policy. I always have a stop loss. So I can lose like two and a half to three buy-ins in a cash game session before I'm cut off no matter what, because it's just too likely that I'll be playing from a place of fear and frustration and trying to get money back rather than just calmly treating each hand as its own event, which is what it, what it really is. Um, so having a stop loss and having uh, a strong sense of self-reflection and self-understanding, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. That's a, yeah, that, that is, I mean, that is the wildest answer I've ever got from asking somebody what they do for work. That is fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's stressful at times. I mean, there's, oh, it's you incredibly know, there's, stressful. It's yeah, both stressful and boring. It's probably not stressful at times. It's probably stressful all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, me and my partner call it stress sweat. Like I could be clean and a good temperature and have on deodorant and I'm still like pitted out an hour into a game because it's just like, yeah, you're on, you're on, you're making important decisions and they're going to matter and you got to not, not mess it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, we could turn this into a, uh, a, a, a poker podcast, but I'll resist the temptation to ask you, I mean, that that's the thing about being a podcaster. I didn't come into podcasting because I'm not, I, I have an insatiable curiosity and I love people. And so anytime I hear about people living, you know, unique lives, it's like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. I want to know everything. But we'll talk about bikes. Uh, what, what made, like, what, yeah, promulgated that decision to take a, a you know, put that career on hold to focus on bikes? Like, that is a huge transition and a big decision to make. So what was the, the reason that the behind that? So I hadn't really ridden bikes much before I moved to park city in 2020, we moved here in the fall of 2020. And I knew from the, from the real estate listing for the condo that we're renting, that it was on a rail trail and that it was good for biking. And I was like, Oh, that sounds nice. Maybe I'll, uh, look into that, you know, Mm. and I got a bike. And that first spring after the snow went away, I realized that nothing was more compelling to me than figuring out how far I could ride my bike. Um, and so I, you know, I started researching it and building up my endurance and, uh, it just, it's incredibly motivating for me to ride my bike far. I also have 
kind of distilled a principle for my life over these four years in Park City, which is that I don't think anything makes me happier than being active outside, um, especially with the people that I love. But alone is great, too. I really love time alone that way. And so just kind of knowing that that's what moves me the most, um, it makes it clear that any decisions I make that that make more long bike rides in my life are good decisions for me, right? Also, I didn't consider myself an athlete until probably my mid-30s. I didn't do anything athletic for a long time. Um, And my partner started teaching me how to strength train, and I realized that I really liked that and that I think I have good genetics for endurance, um, both with like loaded activities and with something like the bike where, you know, it's just that repetitive long-term endurance activity. I think I am really good at that. I think I'm naturally gifted at that. Um, and I had an experience back when I was in Florida before I moved to park city, setting a record. Uh, there's a, Highland Games there and they had a boulder boogie activity which was like separate from the rest of the Highland Games where you had to do like all seven caber toss and whatever else you got stone throw things um what yeah what are the Highland Games I've heard of I don't even know I I don't know all about it all I know like we went there as a festival one year and saw this thing and I decided I wanted to do it the next year and I trained up and I did it and I broke the record it was they had a couple of rocks and they had a field and then you would do laps around the field carrying one of the rocks and a guy with like one of those little measuring wheels which would follow behind you to figure out how exactly how far you had gone in your weaving path through the field okay and so i carried a 94 pound rock about a quarter mile and i broke the record um and i realized like first of all i want to say that the So that taught me a couple of things. One of the things that taught me was the power of having big goals and stating them publicly. I set that goal and I wasn't, I was like in a depression. I was in a funk. I didn't want to do anything. I was like lying in bed, playing video games and playing enough poker to feed myself. Um, When it came time that if I didn't start training, it was, I would, there was no chance I was going to get it. And my partner, meanwhile, Walt had gone around and told our friends, like, Jen's going to break the record. Jen's, Jen's going to do it. She's got this. I know, I believe in her. She's going to kick ass. Like you should come. And I realized like, that's how I got to like a breaking point where I was like, if I don't get myself like out of bed and out in the field, carrying rocks, like this is not going to happen. I'm going to fail. And I'm going to fail in front of people that I love and care about that. I want to show them that I'm tough and good and not that I can only lay in bed and do nothing. Right. <laughs> and so it got me moving at a point where moving was really challenging for me and it, it turned it around. Like it, it solved my mental health crisis because I forced myself to get out there and practice and start training up. And then, so that was one lesson was, and that's actually how we got this big goal in that I said in 2023 about the time trials. I was like, man, I'm just laying on the couch way too much. Like I know now from experience that if I set a huge goal and start telling people that I care about, about it, I'll at least get outside and do stuff and that's going to help me feel better and the problem will disappear. Um, So that was one lesson was that if I set a really ambitious goal and make it public, I am forced into a sort of action that improves my life drastically. Yeah. Um, The other pressure is real. Yeah. Even if you don't know the peers or whatever, you know, just putting out a big goal. I mean, it, it, my, my girlfriend and I, we talk about this all the time as the value of, having a carrot, like something to work towards, something to train for, to motivate you. And like, also like get excited for, um, you, you know, like right now we have a, a, a five day bike packing trip in Oaxaca, Mexico planned for this December. And so, you know, every ride I do right now is it's like, I, I'm always thinking, I'm like, okay, I'm putting in, you know, miles for Oaxaca, you know, everything I do now is like, going to make Oaxaca easier, more enjoyable, more attainable, like all these things, because so it it just like gives the ride like more meaning, I guess, versus just like going on a ride. And, um, you know, I've been riding bikes since I was four years old. So it's nice to have extra motivation to make it a little bit more exciting and dynamic to have that big goal. And then, yeah, you put it out there in the world and, uh, you kind of have to do it. Yeah. And so then the other big lesson it taught me once I did break the record is like how really good it feels to have 
to have a record at something. Mm. You know, uh, self doubt is something that can come for anybody at any time. And there's no better answer for me to self doubt than to say, like, I've got receipts. I carried that rock better than anyone else who's tried to carry that rock. Yeah. And maybe they'll beat me one day and then I'll have to go do it again. But, <laughs> you know, I did this. It feels really good to me to have just like a clear, um, statement that I did something that a lot of people have tried and I did it the best. It feels amazing. And so that, that also contributed to that 24 hour time trial goal. You know, I, I don't know if I can do it this year. I've, uh, kind of changed and got diverted and realized adventure was more compelling to me than the, um, kind of like abstract, uh, athletic achievement goal that started it this year for me. Um, so I've, I've not, I've made choices that were damaging to the 24 hour time trial goal in pursuit of going on the awesome adventures. And I'm totally okay with those decisions, but yeah, I, I hope to, if not this year, then in a future year, break the record on that course and, and uh, get another big receipt that I, I did this thing. Yeah. So your motivation to quit your job and, you know, focus on more athletic pursuits, I mean, is there a, like a career component to this or is it more just like a personal, you mentioned like mental health, you're just like laying around on the couch too much. Was it just more of like a kind of a life shift life? Yeah. Just a life shift. Yeah. If it were possible to make money riding bikes, that would be awesome. But that seems extremely hard to do. I don't think that's a realistic goal to try to make money riding bikes. Yeah. Um, it's something that I just love to do. And I think it's really good for me. Yeah. So do you think you'll, when do you think you'll go back to work? Like, how are you, how are you making that decision? I guess. Uh, if and when I get nervous that I'm running out of money. <laughs> I'll start working again. <laughs> yeah. So you're just really like just enjoying this season of life just and pouring it. as much as you can in right now. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. How did you even hear about bikepacking and, and ultra endurance racing? I mean, this is, I think it's becoming more and more popular, but um, as we'll talk about, like these races are fairly well unknown. Not very many competitors are even in the field. Um, I bet a, a bunch of my audience hasn't heard of, uh, like I had never heard of, um, the big sky spectacular and yeah. I know of mountain bike odyssey because, uh, Falcon who you rode with actually reached out to me and put it on my radar. And he may have mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned, but my girlfriend and I wound up visiting him in Costa Rica. He owns a surf school out there and we went and rode bikes and hung out with him, uh, in Costa Rica. So I've, I, I've, familiar with through that of that one through him um but yeah anyway like you're I'm, I'm curious like how you're even how you even were introduced to this wild world of uh ultra endurance bikepacking yeah so that first season in 2021 i rode my first 100k i rode grand fondo moab and came home from it and i was like done like i want to ride bikes far how do i do it what is it and the first thing i learned about was ryan denering and uh, I found my local club and have had some fantastic times riding with those guys and learning from them. Um, I also found uh, Heather Poscovich is a very accomplished, like more road oriented, although she has done some bike packing as well, um, ultra cyclist. And I read her blog and learned about what she had done and reached out to her and got coaching that season and have been on and off co getting coached by her since then. Um, What's her name again? And then Heather Poscovich. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't know her yeah. either. Yeah. She, um, I can't, she, I can't remember if she won outright or was second overall, but she had a really good showing in race across the West that season. Um, and I read her blog about the big sky spectacular and I was like, wow, that's wild. Like you got to camp with bears. No way I could do that. <laughs> um, and so the spectacular had been on my radar since then as like an impossible goal that I probably couldn't do. Uh, and then once I was almost done with the real wheel race, I was like, all right, I think I could do it. You know, probably I could. Um, and then the Montana bike odyssey, I think it was probably like Instagram recommendations that got it on my radar at all. Just like, you know, I was following that account and hadn't really looked into it. And then when I saw five days till we depart, I was like, wow, I would really like to do one more this year. Mm. Um, and that one, 
that one was crazy because if I had done more homework, I probably wouldn't have gone. <laughs> it was right. tough. It was tougher than I thought I was ready for. Um, yeah. But I, I did it. Yeah, you did. It First place. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're you're tearing it up. So you hired you hired the the coach to get ready for the wheel race. I did hire her. Yes, I got I um I didn't want programming because I found like I felt that having her program all my rides kind of turns riding into work. So I didn't hire her for programming, but I did hire her for all kinds of consultation about equipment decisions and like overall strategy advice for how to how to undertake it that first season i hired her with no racing goals at all i just wanted to know could i complete some very big rides um and and i'm still not sure about the competitive stuff i really i enjoy competition a lot uh and i am definitely a competitively driven person but with bike pack racing it's not clear to me if the sacrifices it takes to to do really well in deep fields are worth it to me compared to like the fun of the adventure. Like I, I'm, I'm going to want to still take pictures. I write up a blog every day, right? Like I write my ride recap at the end of every day. That's part of what a day is for me. Like that's part of shutting it down at the end of the day is like kind of telling myself and people that want to read it, the story of that day so that I can put it away and be ready for the next one. Like that's yeah. not realistic. If you want to really, if you want to win big races, you know, it, you probably yeah, can't you afford are. an hour a day. Well, I, I did. I did. It happened. But it was, we were four competitors and one guy scratched pretty early. So we were yeah. three competitors. So I, I don't, you know, I don't want to take anything away from the other competitors. They rode an incredible race and did great. But that's a lot different than showing up at like the Tour Divide where there's going to be right. a ton of elite athletes from all over the world pursuing the same thing as me. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Come to tour divide CT Arizona trail, and you're not going to have the time for an hour blog post every day. If you want to be competitive. And I was right. actually interested to get your thoughts on, you know, what appeals to you more, the, the racing competitive side of it or the adventure side of bike packing. And it sounds like you're still, I mean, you're relatively, you are new to this sport and these experiences. So it sounds like you're still kind of figuring that out for yourself. Yeah, I think that the having some level of competition is really, really fun for me because it helps keep me focused on a goal and eager to try to like maximize my progress down the course every day, right? I feel like if I were just bike packing and not bike pack racing, I don't know that I would stick to the plan at all. I might go 50 mile detour this way because I heard about something cool over here and then I'm meeting friends and staying there for days. like. I don't know that I would keep my self focused towards the goal at all without a competitive component and a reason why now we're going towards this finish line here. And I like the simplicity of life when I know what the finish line is and I know that I'm trying to get there. Mm. Um, so then the other options, you can just enter events like races, but take a more laid back approach to them. That's always an option. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't have to go without sleep and everything. Like there's plenty of people that they'll get eight hours of sleep every night, you know, and, yeah. and still pushing yourselves. Like these are not, uh, you know, I think, I think I have a tendency. I, I don't know if we all do to like downplay, um, you know, what a huge accomplishment it is to finish any one of these races. It doesn't matter if you go on four hours of sleep or eight hours of sleep or whatever, like it's woefully impressive no matter what approach you take to it even signing up is such a huge accomplishment i think you know like the mental audacity to be like i'm going to do that is huge like that's a huge yeah. mental barrier that we all have to get past just to get to the start line and say i'm gonna try something fucking insane right now <laughs> yeah hey i was interested it, i think it was i forget who you were interviewing might have been nicolette but someone, you know, I can't remember her name. It was someone else, I think. But um, you talked with someone about uh, bike pack races with enforced downtime. Mm. Do you remember that? Well, there's a few of those events. Um, yeah, so I don't I'm know curious exactly about those. No, I'm curious about that list of those events. How do I know what those even are? Yeah, the first one that's coming to mind is like Westford's Way, um, Silk Road. Ma 
Silk Road isn't like that. They have checkpoints, um, but like Westford's Way in Iceland, uh, it's like, you know, the, the clock stops for a certain amount of time, but uh, I'm trying to remember what other races off the top of my head and I'm drawing a blank right now, but there's not, there's not that many of them that I'm familiar with, you know, that, that go by that, uh, that format, you know, yeah, where that's there's a like format this... that's really attractive to me. Yeah. Where like when it's on, it's all the way on and then we're done and we're going to have some delicious food and a really good sleep before we get started yeah. again. Yeah. Um, Tyler, is it Tyler Wacker? I believe is the rate, one of the race directors for Westford's way. He's been on the podcast before and I interviewed him when he was like right before he launched that event, he was like moving to Iceland and I caught up with him in Austin before he did that. But I've, I've kept up with him in that event and I know that they really are emphasizing the cultural aspect into the bike pack racing, which I, I think is great, you know, and I think that what you're speaking to is something that a lot of people struggle with, which is like, you know, you want to push yourself and you also don't want to miss, you know, scenery at night, for example, you know, you just, or you don't want to blow through it so quickly that, you know, you miss the cultural experiences. Like you're in Iceland for the first time, perhaps you're like, I just rode my bike. I didn't sleep. I was sleep deprived and everything hurt and it was beautiful, but you know, I, I don't know. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. And so I personally love that format and it's something I would be interested in doing. And I know for Iceland, it was intentional, intentional, like they, they're highlighting certain regions of Iceland that you stay in, you get the cultural experience and you get to ride your bike. So it does seem like a, a great way to do it. And then there's the whole conversation. I don't know if you've heard about this, but, um, y you know, the kind of, there's some controversy around, you know, safety, um, for, you know, these, uh, uh, these ultra events where people are pushing themselves, their bodies and their brains to the extreme. And, um, you know, and how safe is that? And, and yeah. should we look at, you know, alternative race formats and where I fall is like options. You know, I think the great thing about this sport is that it's all unsanctioned. And so race directors can kind of run the event any way they want to. Um, but we do have options as racers. And so you can, you know, if that's what you, if that's the experience you want to have, you can enter that race. And then, you know, within that race, you don't have to go on four hours of sleep. You can sleep longer. Like, you know, the yeah. decision ultimately, I think for safety comes down to each individual rider, but having all those different options, I think is, is really great for people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I wish I knew some of the, uh, some of the other events, but people can blow me up in the comment section and let me know all the ones that I forgot. And maybe we'll, we'll get, uh, we'll get the answers. We'll, we'll compile a list for you Good. and that can be awesome. your next goal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you finished, uh, the Montana bike odyssey six days ago, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I came in on Tuesday afternoon and now it's Monday. So it's about seven almost. How are you feeling? Uh, like take, give us an inventory of your body. I mean, not just after MBO, but after, a. I mean, in the last four months, I did the math in the last four months you have ridden, God damn it. Where are my notes? Oh, here we go. 6,250 miles in the past four months. So like, yeah. How's your body feeling? How are you holding up? I'm holding up really well. And uh, shout out to bike fitter John Higgins in Salt Lake. Uh, <laughs> I think he gets a lot of credit for how good my body feels. Um, I really, I have a new sensation of some fingertip numbness on the right hand. Okay. Uh, I'm, you know, that'll go away eventually, probably yeah, some months. Probably. Um, the saddle area held up good this time. Um, muscles seem good. Tendons seem good. Like. In general, my body is good. I went out for a mountain bike ride yesterday and didn't have any real physical complaints and felt That's like crazy. happy to be on the bike. Yeah. That is wild. That's so impressive. You are an endurance machine. Your body was just like made for this kind of stuff. Yeah. What about yeah, uh, I, mentally? Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I got saddle sores on like day three of the wheel race, like open 
skinless spots. And I was terrified about what that was going to mean for my ability to finish. Um, but I kept uh, Tegeter and bandages on there and replaced them every day. And it was that was enough to let some healing happen. And I made it. It was fine. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, scary things can go wrong and you can still finish. Good. I want. I actually want to uh, earmark that. I want to come back to your saddle sores, but I let. Let's talk about your, like how you're holding up mentally, because um, there's a huge mental component to this, and uh, you know, doing this many miles in such a short amount of time uh, is is stressful. It's hard. You know, it's it's physically demanding, but it's also mentally demanding, and how do you think you're holding up mentally? I think I'm doing really well mentally. Um, I, a lot of people like to think about like toughing stuff out and spending time in the pain cave and take pride in their ability to grind through unpleasant experiences. And I've always been interested in making my time on the bike as pleasant as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done my riding in just gorgeous places, you know, especially in the West, but throughout the country, and I spend my time on the bike, like in a state of awe and happiness, looking out at things and like the legs kind of take care of themselves. Like the pedaling just happens. And I'm just looking around, looking at animals, looking at plants, looking at the sky and the clouds and the sun and the landscape and listening to good music. And so I, I don't, I find that activity generally to be a recharging rather than a draining one. Um, yeah. And like the tough times absolutely come. Like, I'm not going to say that there haven't been tough times. The tough times happen. Right. And I think I'm good at getting through those too, but I don't, I don't get on the bike in order to like buckle down and make it through another grueling day of hard work. Yeah. I get on the bike to get out there and have a good time. And most of the time, like 85 to 95% of the time, that's the mental state that I'm in is one of happiness and awe. Is that your natural state or is that something you've like worked on to develop? You know, you, you said, I, you know, you try to make your time on your bike fun and happy and enjoyable. Like, are there things you do or is that more of just like who you are in your personality? I think it's mostly who I am in my personality. My hardest times on the bike were in that first season where, you know, there were like 30 and 40 mile rides where I was like really digging deep to make it home at the end of them and having a really hard time. And I think that as I got the, the adaptations from that work, like I don't get into that really awful digging deep state by, very often anymore. Um, Interesting. And I think also just realizing that that's the number one thing I'm interested in in life is to spend quality time outside. Like, <laughs> that just gives me so much clarity. Like, this is what I'm about and here I am and I'm doing it right now. Like, this is it. You've got the sky, you've got the animals, you've got things to look at. Like, where else would you want to be than here? It's just, yeah, I guess, I guess mostly it's just who I am and how I relate to being outside on my bike. Have you always been, you know, felt this way? Uh, I'm wondering if this is partially informed by how much time you've spent inside playing online poker or inside a casino. And like, yeah. I'm wondering if like, this is a stage of your life for like, Oh, there's a big wide world. And I just want to be outside all the time. Yeah. I think that's a good observation. Um, I've enjoyed outdoor activities my whole life, but with way less hours dedicated to them and way less immersed in the outdoors. Um, and, and a lot of those years, you know, I had, I lived in California and then in uh, Las Vegas and then in central Florida, all playing poker and doing some stuff outside once in a while. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think it is kind of like a midlife realization that the good stuff is outside for me. Yeah. Yeah. What has been your biggest barrier to entry into bike pack racing? Um, you know, for you personally, what, what was the biggest challenges that you have or are continuing to have, have to overcome to take on these big challenges? I would say equipment in general and camping. Um, okay. so to give you a little more on both of those with equipment, uh, I didn't own a bike for many decades. I don't come naturally to doing mechanical tasks or 
understanding maintenance and repair. Yeah. And so it, there's so many freaking parts on a bicycle and everybody's got a different list of like what you absolutely must carry for field repair. And then you have the question of whether you're even going to know how to use it when it mm -hmm. comes time to do the field repair. And so um, that's been intimidating for me with all of my time on the bike and especially intimidating as I start getting myself into more and more remote places where there's not going to be a cell phone to call and get help from a friend about how to use this. Like it's just going to be me and, yeah. and you know, I guess put, pushing the SOS button on the inReach if I can't figure something out. Yeah. Um, so mechanics in general. And then with camping, I used to do some hiking and camping 20 years ago, but I hadn't slept outside in decades. Yeah. And I didn't think I was up for it anymore. I really thought like I work so hard, like I get so tired at the end of the day on the bike and I just want a shower and a bed. I can't imagine stringing together multiple days of big bike effort and having camping in between that sounded really not attractive at all. Um, and I had a couple of instances on the wheel race where I was forced to overnight outside of a hotel and I didn't melt or die. Like it, it worked fine. I woke up and I felt better than I did when I went to sleep and you know, <laughs> the next day went fine. So I kind of already had the seed of proof that camping was somehow possible. Um, and for that, I only carried an emergency bivy. For the spectacular, I carried the emergency bivy and a sleeping pad, but not sufficient thermal layers to really sleep comfortably at 45 degrees. And I was really lucky. I was riding with my friend Justin Short, and he had a sleeping bag and a puffy jacket. And he was like, borrow this puffy jacket. Like, I don't really need this, and you look like you do. Um, Justin and we both Short? Yeah. I th Justin M. Short? Yes, Justin M. Short, B.A. of the Gravel yeah. Brain Trust. Yeah, B.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he listens to the show. I think he he would send me some uh, YouTube videos every once in a while that he does. But and yeah, I don't he know makes him wild personally. Music but... videos about uh, with kind of Weird Al style, writing his own lyrics and making a music video to popular tunes uh, with yeah. content of gravel biking or winter biking or stuff like that. Shout out Justin. Yeah. So. <laughs> I was really lucky that I rode that ride with him, that race with him, because he was able to show me like what I was missing in order to be able to camp comfortably, mm. right? Just a little more thermal stuff. Sleeping bag makes a big difference. And so that's what I did in the days between deciding to do the Montana bike odyssey and leaving. I was scrambling all over town. I, I drove down to Salt Lake every day, three days in a row in order to get more luggage. And I already had stuff in the closet that I hadn't ever used, like a sleeping bag and a puffy jacket. <laughs> And so I carried a lot more warm gear for the Odyssey than I had on any of the previous. And it meant that I was able to sleep outside comfortably and confidently. The bears were okay. still kind of scary for me. Um, my next step is to get an Ursac and actually use bear protection, you know, or whatever bear mitigation strategies. Cause I just left my bike far away from me and hoped that no one was coming. And I, I switched to where after I got really scared one night, I only was camping in towns and at designated campgrounds. I figured that would also help uh, with bear interactions. What is an Ursac? Uh, it's this awesome bag. I don't know who makes it, but you are like the kind of Latin root for bear. It's a bag that is made of such tough material that you don't have to hang it. So you can put all your food inside of there and then just tie it to a tree within reach of humans and bears. And if the bear gets interested and comes and paws at it, it can't break the rope or the fabric of the bag. So oh. it's a very uh, convenient and approachable form of bear food protection. Yeah, I, that's a question from somebody who lives in Texas and we don't have bears, so I don't get out into bear country. I've well, I've ridden in Colorado, but we didn't see any bears. But anyway, I just haven't, yeah, haven't got the opportunity to ride amongst the the big predators out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so, I felt, sometimes I felt like I was doing that without enough knowledge or uh, skills. <laughs> I mean, I had my bear spray and yeah. I kept the bike far away from me when I had food on it, but which is always yeah, but you're just like, all right, I'll just cross yeah. my fingers. Yeah. What What is it about camping that that is so daunting? Is it? I mean, is it just that you didn't have the right equipment? It sounds like wildlife is also a factor. Yeah, I would say it was equipment, and it was just you know getting so accustomed to being indoors. Right, I had slept in beds for the last two two decades. Right, with and. <laughs> 
you you hear other people say, oh, you know, I, I'm too old for that. I could never do that. And it, it's easy to believe that and think, yeah, I need indoor plumbing. You know, I need temperature control. I need to be able to w- wash my bibs out in the sink and use the hotel towels to dry them off. Like, yeah, the conveniences that I'm used to, it's easy to believe that they're necessary. And that's kind of where I was. I just couldn't imagine sleeping on the ground and then waking up ready to go ride bikes for another 120 miles or whatever. That just sounded wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. It certainly is far, far, far outside the scope of most people's human experience. So it's not something that's like readily identifiable and, and a feeling of like comfortability to say, okay, I'm going to go do that. You know? Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's one of those out there things and it just comes with, you know, the experience of doing it and then finding out that you can doing it. And comfort is huge, whether you're on the bike or you're sleeping or you're riding through rain, like the more you can find ways to be comfortable, the happier you're going to be. And I think ultimately it leads to a better performance, you know, because if you're like in a mental good headspace, then it's going to make everything easier, more, um, more approachable. But, you know, up until then, it's like, you just got to find out through doing, uh, that, that you can do all of it. You know, that's just an experiential yeah. thing. I wanted, I wanted to get back to your saddle sores. Uh, it's always a fun topic. Uh, you mentioned Tegraderm, which is actually another thing that I've never heard of anyone using. Um, I know what it is because of tattoos. Uh, if yeah. anyone doesn't know, uh, Tegraderm is like a second skin type material that you can, um, the way I've always used it is like after you get a tattoo nowadays, I used to just saran wrap a tattoo, but nowadays most artists will cover it with Tegraderm, which is like, it's a really crazy material that's like, it, it really is like a second skin. It, it, it adheres so well to your skin. It's not thick. Like you can even see the wrinkles in your skin through the Tegraderm. Like it totally conforms to your skin and it really adheres. Um, but I never heard anyone actually using that for saddle sores before. So uh, how did you find out about that and how well do those work? It sound like pretty good. Coach, coach Heather and her coach, Greg Grand George, they taught me about it and I had it in my kit you know, in my first aid kit. And I realized once I had open skin back there that this is what it was for. It was for covering up the open skin and creating that second skin for you. Um, With using it for saddle sores in particular, it, that is like a little bit beyond what the adhesive is up for, for keeping that in place all day. So I would usually find that it had slipped by the end of the day. But uh, something that I, I experienced and that I've heard other people say is like the worst time for your raw skin is like the first half hour or whatever that you're on the bike each day that's when you really feel every little piece of contact with the saddle and it's excruciating and so just having that that cover there in place to start the day let me get on the bike and get started and i would usually find when it came time to shower the next day that the bandage had slipped and wasn't doing the job anymore but it still wasn't hurting so were you, cause you said that happened on day three of the wheelman race Were were your saddle sores able to like heal and recover over the rest of the race? I mostly just held steady with the situation. I'm, I think I arguably had a little bit of, of healing and recovering, but I put those bandages on every day until the end of the race. So what, what other ways? Okay. So that was your wheelman race. How did your, uh, how did your health care down there uh, evolve like did you establish a really good health routine or um did your butt just get tough over riding six thousand miles yeah i think it was toughness i think the problem with with the beginning of the wheel race like i had done a lot of my training on road instead of gravel and that was probably 50 50 paved and unpaved for the wheel Mm. race um and so early on in washington state there were a couple of days of like over 100 miles on rough gravel and I think that just upped the level of vibrations that were going into my butt to cause saddle problems that I didn't expect to have. And yeah. then kind of had to keep it steady to, you know, get finished and give give that area time to actually heal and recover. Um, I didn't get any significant problems on either of the next two events. Yeah. Um, so just toughness. Yeah, I think just toughness. Were you uh, watching your, your, um, uh, your, did you wear chamois shorts? Yeah. yeah. Were and you washing the, them regularly? Were you yeah, using any the ointments or anything? Had, 
for the wheel race, I had two pair. And so I was able to have like one fully washed and dried at the end of each day. Um, I use, uh, for as chamois cream, I use a product called Lantiseptic, which is 50% lanolin and 50% general lotion. Um, so that's my chamois butter. And uh, that's what I use during rides. And then after the ride, I use pure lanolin um, mm. as like an overnight ointment uh, and leave everything open to breathe and put that lanolin on there. And it makes a big difference. Um, so for both Big Sky and the Odyssey, I only had one bib. And so I didn't wash it every single day because if I'm camping out, it's just hanging from the bike and trying to at least air out but i'm not washing it mm. uh so at least every two to three days getting a good wash on the bib yeah what's harder normal life or racing bikes riding six thousand miles over four months what's harder i don't know my life is kind of never normal so it's it's hard to say that my normal life is harder because my normal life is pretty sweet um yeah. honestly I, I think normal life is harder. Uh, this, the thing that I love the most about, or one of the things that I love the most about bike pack racing is how simple it makes decision making. Mm -hmm. You have a goal. The goal is many, many hundreds or thousands of miles in the future. Each day, you have to make sure that you wake up, eat, drink, bathe, and bike. Right? Like you, you're. The th there's a lot, a lot of options are closed to you. You're not interested in going on a tour in the museum this trip, right? You don't right. want to, there's so many things that you could do in normal life that are closed and having that sense of like very clear focus and goal orientation is really fun. I really like that. And normal right. life isn't like that. In normal life, there's hundreds of possibilities that you could do at any given time and deciding which one of them is the best is really challenging. And sometimes you don't decide on any of them and then you just lay on the couch for weeks at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and then you feel bad about all the things you didn't choose to do. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, then you're yeah. beating yourself up for wasting your life. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Whereas when I'm, when I'm on a race, like it's very obvious what I need to do each day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. The simplicity of riding bikes and knowing, you know, this is the route I need to follow and I need to go a hundred miles because I got to make this grocery store by nine o'clock or, you know, whatever, like the, the, the things are always so very obvious and clear when you're out riding your bike, but daily life for most people is hard. It's like, God, yeah. things are coming at you in a million different directions and you got to say yes or no, or lay on the couch and, dwell on it for weeks and never do anything like it just you know it, it feels like life feels daunting often yeah so, yeah what was your training like so i'm i'm yeah I, as i was thinking about this i'm assuming that like you know mbo was trained by uh big sky and big sky was trained by the wheelman race um i mean you're just maintaining that fitness but, you know, leading up to the Great American Wheelman race, uh, how much time did you spend training and what, yeah, what did you do pr to prepare? What was your training like? So this was the first time that I tried to maintain some type of cycling fitness through the winter. Every other year when winter comes and the snow comes, I just put the bike away and I don't think about it. So yeah. this year through the winter, I rode outdoors as long as that was viable. I don't have a fat bike yet. So that was just times when the roads were relatively clear and dry. I was able to do some outdoor rides. And then I did probably around three weekend trips to Nevada to desert areas where I could ride outside and put some bigger days together. Um, and then coming into the spring, I started uh, like when when the local randonneuring chapter would have a brevet, like they're going to ride a 200 K on Saturday. It's going to be 120 miles instead of driving down there on Saturday morning and then driving home Saturday night, I would ride my bike there on Friday, spend a night in the hotel, ride the event with them and spend the night in the hotel and then ride my bike back. And I kind of built those little weekend motel tours bigger and bigger. Um, and then my last big one before the wheel race, I did a, 800 miles in six days tour of Utah that I put together. So I went wow. 
down to uh, Zion and Moab, or not Moab, uh, St. George, and then up a different way. So I took a, I did a big solo motel tour uh, to prepare. And the, the, I missed two things in all of that prep. One was um, I did not spend enough time on gravel. Hmm. So that's, that's how the saddle source came to get me and came to surprise me is that I had conditioned my ass to, you know, 10 or 12 hour days on pavement, but that's a really different thing than 12 hour days on gravel. Um, Yeah. Big time. Yeah. And I also. Surprisingly bigger. I mean, it's like, you you know, your hands are shaking, you know, it's like, it's reverberating through yeah your whole body. So it just beats you up a lot more. Yeah, for sure. So I, and I, I, gravel segments on my tour of utah that i get on and i'd be like wow this is really hard there's a road right there <laughs> there because there's nobody telling me not to yeah. um but i could have been a little more diligent about gravel prep um and then you know all of those things were all using hotels only which was my strategy for the wheel race so none of that was camping practice either right what about weight training? I saw on your Instagram you did a three fifteen deadlift, which I thought was impressive. I don't. That was a, years ago, so maybe you're yeah. stacking on more weight these days. No, but less, yeah. less for less. sure. <laughs> uh, that was my. That was kind of my reintroduction to athleticism and enjoying moving and using my body. Uh, that I, I, my partner taught me how to weight train, how to strength train, um, and I just enjoyed pursuing that as its own end for a really long time. Um, mm. so I had a deep and long history with the gym when I got into riding bikes and I've decided, or at least, I don't know, at least the way it's worked out so far is I find doing squats or deadlifts in a week where I'm doing 30 or whatever hours on the bike to be just a non-starter. So I've kind mm. of stopped training lower body in the gym. I probably ought to try to do it again sometime. Uh, but now I just go in the gym and just do like bench press and shoulder press and pull-ups and upper body only stuff to kind of balance out all the work that my legs are getting on the bike. Yeah. I, I mean, I take a similar approach. I have no idea what the efficacy of, of this is. Um, but just naturally because I'm a cyclist, I go to the gym three or four times a week. Um, I rarely hit my legs, you know, I'm just yeah. focused on upper body. I feel pretty good about what's going on with my legs. I feel pretty strong. And it yeah. also like, I don't want to fatigue my legs in the gym and then it'll then- affect my bike ride or, you know, I'm, I went on a long bike ride and now I go to the gym and I'm, I don't have much, you know, strength in the gym. So I, I don't know what the right answer is, but that's what works for me as well. It's like, I'm, I'm hitting the legs. I'm getting my leg days. Yeah. In. They're doing it for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, in a lot of these races, there's a lot of, um, bike pushing or even like lifting your bike over trees and all kinds of stuff. So I think complementing with upper body fitness, you may not think about it, you know, to be a, a, a good cyclist that you need upper body strength. And it's not only, you know, lifting your bike, it's also like, um, just holding your body up for days and days and days on end, you know, having the muscular strength to do that, you know? Yeah. So how much time did you spend in the, how much time are you spending in the gym as a, as a metric of training for these? Um, maybe three to four hours a week of gym time. That's solid. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's one of the things that my partner and I love to do together. So, I mean, he's going every day. Like, why wouldn't I just say, sure, I'll come along. It's our gym is a half mile from our house. So we walk there usually in beautiful weather and then do some stuff and then walk home. Yeah. I go with my uh, 14 year old daughter. She's my gym buddy. And it's, nice. it's just, a, it's just a lot of fun to have someone in the gym to go with. Like it really yeah, makes it, it's that like buddy you makes a huge difference. having that goal, you know, it's like, okay, it's like an accountability partner, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. okay, this is just what we do. You know, it's like our thing, you know, and yep. it makes it, makes it easier. Um, where are we at? Oh, I will say one more note on the gym. Please. I've really ramped up my recovery and mobility work at the gym as I've stacked on the miles. So a typical day in the gym is going to look like, you know, a couple sets of some kind of pressing, maybe some pulling, and then like 20 or 30 minutes on the mat doing stretching and using a foam roller. Um, And I just look up various YouTube videos to coach me on that. I don't really have a 
set scheme. You know, I kind of bounce off different videos, but I, I've started to take that stuff really seriously because I'm really grateful to have a functional body and I, I hope to give it enough attention and care to keep it that way. Yeah. That's an area where I could certainly improve. I, it's hard just to find the time. I'm a single dad. I have two daughters. And so, uh, between like, you know, running this business, being a dad, finding time to go to the gym, you know, finding time to go ride my bike. And then it's like, okay, I also need to be doing stretching and yoga. And I love yeah. it all. It's just like, I do find that the mobility stuff gets knocked down. It's not my favorite part. It's less exciting. And so I don't prioritize it as much as I need to. And I'm 44. So we're similar ages. And as I'm getting older, longevity continues to be a word that I'm percolating in my mind all the time. It's like, all right, you want to be able to use this body for a long time. You want to keep being yeah. able to go do this kind of stuff. So it really is going to pay dividends. And so does strength training. Like all of it is just so important. So let's dig into, let's just go through your, uh, three races real well, maybe not real quick, but we let's, let's knock them off. So great American wheel race was your first and uh, this was the first year for the Great American Wheel Race. So you're the first guest that's come on the podcast to talk about it. And uh, worth noting, you were the first female finisher and fourth overall. So um, you mentioned that that was your first ever big bikepacking race and, uh, and you won it. So that's amazing. How many people participated in that one? I want to say somewhere in the mid 20s. Um, and there was a lot of confusion about uh, the different categories in that race. I think we kind of registration happened with no distinction between um, a racing and a tourist or semi supported category. And so a lot of people like changed their designation mid race as they realized that they did want to, you know, have various kinds of support um, or put shortcut like there's a lot of detours and you know, sections that people decided to route around. And so a lot of uh, kind of chaos with designations during that race. Um, what was the question? Oh, how many people participated? You said around oh, yeah. 20 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere <laughs> between 20 and 30, I would say. I forgot the question too for a second. I was like, what did I ask? Get, just get lost in the conversation. Yeah. Well, that's good. I uh, did. Do you know that there's another race that it, it seems similar to this one, uh, the Bike Nonstop US? Yeah. And I, yeah. I didn't, I had it kind of on my list of things to do to compare them before I really made a final commitment about which one I was going to ride in. But by the time I had that in my list of things to do, the community that was forming around the wheel race was just so fun and encouraging that I was like, who cares? Like, this is a good one. I'm riding this one. Yeah. Um, but I it like the like, thing that I really like about both of those is trying to minimize car interactions. Big time. Yeah. 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 That's that's huge. The bike nonstop US is one that kind of appeals to me. Um, man, I am drawing a blank. Is it Trans America? Is it the Trans Am that goes the on the road? Yeah. Oh man, my brain is not I, I should have taken some mushrooms this morning or something <laughs> <laughs> it's my understanding that that nathan jones is the race director behind both of those and yeah. that he created bike nonstop us as an answer to the problem of fatal car crashes for riders on the trans am route you yeah. know that route was originally designed decades ago and traffic patterns have really changed um and so I think that he probably regards that route as too dangerous to be a good choice now, but I think he keeps offering it because so many people have the dream of comparing themselves to people that have ridden that exact route in the past that, that he still keeps giving that as an option. Um, and I mean, that's just all based on stuff I've seen online. I don't know him personally at all. Uh, yeah. And I think that yeah. the bike nonstop route is, is, is trying to answer that problem of car interaction and put you more on gravel, more on bike trail when possible. Um, yeah. To hopefully yeah, I keep think riders it, safe. Yeah, absolutely. I'm all for that and I'm all for, uh, choices, you know, I mean, I, I think personal accountability is huge and if people want to do trans am more power to you, that's something that I would never personally do. You know, that's, that's just, uh, being safe is one of my 
biggest priorities, if not my biggest priority whenever I'm out there. And so I've had, um, and I am forgetting his name. I had uh, the winner of Bike Nonstop US come on a couple years ago. I can picture him perfectly, uh, but I'm forgetting his name right now. But I haven't, again, the American, Great American Wheel Race is new, and it looks like it's following a similar um, you know, ethos and approach as bike nonstop us, you're going from West to East coast, primarily avoiding, uh, major roads when possible. Um, so I'd love to get like your perspective as a person who's done it. Like how was that route and, you know, safety being a big concern, how safe did you feel out there? It was awesome. There were some hiccups, as you'd always have with the first year of running an event, especially because this route, uh, Evan Deutsch, the leader of our race and the winner of our race, was the first to try this route. It had been put together, okay. you know, working with different people who had local expertise and working with Google Maps extensively and looking at Street View and trying to decide what was good. And the people who put it together did a ton of work that was and it came out awesome. But there were there were several surprises running into private land where they didn't expect it, you know, finding the trail to be rougher and more challenging than expected. So I think that the, the being in the middle of the pack, I think we probably, I probably had 12 or 15 major detours along that route wow. that came up during the race as Evan went there and was like, uh, I don't know if you guys want to hoist over this private property fence, but, uh, that's what I did. I'm still going, you know, and then the, the race directors would be like, Oh, we've got you guys in an alternate route. Like here's where everyone else should go. Um, but the route was amazing. It was the, 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 there was some challenge in the, I, I came as mostly a roadie with limited gravel experience, limited off-road experience. And especially some of the early stuff in Washington and Montana was at the edge of what I felt able to do on the bike or just past the edge. And then I was walking, but I grew a ton as a cyclist because of it. You know, I was in a lot of terrain that was just barely over my head and I started to learn how to navigate it and ride through it. Um, the, we had a couple of times, you know, you always end up with a couple of times where you're on a highway that you'd rather not be on bridging two pieces of things that are great to be on, you know, but I yeah. felt that for the length of the route, the amount of time that I felt car stress was very reasonable, very limited. Um, I actually felt like some of the bike trail in the East, like in Iowa and Indiana, some of that bike trail felt like the most dangerous time for me with cars because you had this super rural bike trail that no one was on. I'm riding at two in the morning or whatever. And I feel alone in the world. But the intersections with major roads, when, when you'd have a perpendicular intersection crossing a major road, they would have the stop signs and stuff for me. But of course, I'm like trying to keep my momentum and I'm trying to crane my head around the cornfields to like clear the intersection before I get there. But I felt like those intersections were some of the most dangerous because it's e easy to be in your own bubble and feel like no one's out there. But there's cars out there and they there was no signage at all on the car roads in that area. Right. So the car is going to maintain its 50 or whatever and is not looking for you and there's trees or cornfields a lot of the time making it really hard to clear that intersection early so that, that was some of the scariest for me um that's so wild that they that no one had ridden that route before they put a race on it that is yeah. that is adventurous how are they adventurous. <laughs> how are they communicating to you as a racer um, we were in, in a WhatsApp. real time whatsapp yeah, yeah we had a whatsapp group yeah. Um, and by the end we had a separate channel for official detours so that you could kind of reference it. Cause it was mm. pretty confusing when that was just all swallowed up in pages and pages of chatter about what yeah. was going on with everybody. So Evan got the biggest adventure out of everybody. He was the, the, the truther of the route and he, yeah. he was just disseminating the, information. Back. The incredible <laughs> amount that he beat everybody by. I mean, he beat, he beat the next competitor by over a week, I think. And oh, wow. The, yeah. Yeah. He finished, I think he finished in 19 days and we were at like 27 and 28. Um, wow. So the, the fact that he was able to fly through that course through areas that we all got detoured around as being too difficult or dangerous, it's just incredibly mind blowing. Like it was a, a really awesome performance by him. Yeah. And, I'd like to hear that story too. Yeah, you, sh you should. I, I would love for you to interview him. 
<laughs> curious to hear what he was up to that whole time. You're like, I've got some questions for him. <laughs> yeah. Man, what was your, uh, I mean, it's, it's all the way across the country. So it's such a big, big race and a big undertaking, but did you have a favorite section or a favorite state from, from that one? Well, you might gather from my choices the rest of the season that Montana really caught my attention. Um, I love big wide views. I love seeing the horizon and I love seeing mountains on the horizon. And, uh, so that made Montana really special for me. Um, a lot of the East kind of looked the same. After starting around Iowa, we were more and more on bike path. That bike path was often an old railroad and had trees that had been planted probably when the railroad was built, lining both mm. sides of it. So I spent a ton of time in a beautiful tunnel of green, just only able to look forward and up, like not really much to take in in terms of like sweeping landscape. And I had a great time with that. The shade was really nice. You know, like I, I got no complaint about that kind of trail, but, you know, seeing the 360 degree view of horizon on all sides and just beautiful, empty landscape is uh, really compelling for me. Yeah, so. absolutely. It, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, what, were you surprised that you won that one? Uh, kind of. So, um, <laughs> the, the biggest female competitor and, uh, I would say a much tougher and stronger rider than me is Christy Tracy. She dropped to the sport class out of race class and into sport class somewhere in the first week. Um, because the route put us, we had to do a detour from the planned route and it put us on, uh, uh, an interstate shoulder for a while. And she had a, bad crash, I think in a similar environment and just wasn't up for that. Um, and oh. so she got a ride through that section and accepted the drop to the tourist class. She beat me by a significant amount, but, uh, I, you know, I, who knows may or may not have received further assistance. Her husband was driving their, uh, van, their adventure van with full bike tools alongside her throughout the country. Um, and it's not clear to me what the degree of interaction there was. Um, yeah. But once she dropped, just based on who was in the female field, it was kind of clear to me that as long as I stayed anywhere near my target pace and just completed, like as long as I didn't screw up bad enough that I had to quit, that I would win the female field. And I had a somewhere around Nebraska is where it really turned into a race for me. And I had a lot of fun racing. Um, Evan was off the front. No one was ever going to catch Evan. And then the next two were Greg and Adam. Uh, Greg Frisley and Adam Kidd. And I had made friends with them earlier in the year. We all met up in Vegas, like before the start of the race and rode together for a day or two. Uh, and I had a lot of fun, like trying to figure out how to beat those guys. I was really interested in trying to make it into second instead of fourth. Um, yeah. And I kept like reducing, because I, I showed up at that start line expecting to get eight hours of, I wanted six to eight hours of sleep every night. I was going to sleep inside in a motel every night you know, and I was going to eat real meals. I started out eating one to two real sit down meals a day. I really didn't back that off until I got into this kind of racer mentality around Nebraska. So I, I kept doing more and more, you know, I was like doing 24 hour pushes and 28 hour pushes. And I oh. knew from Strava, cause I was following those guys on Strava. I knew that they hadn't, Adam had a little bit more of a, like an ultra cycling background. Greg didn't have that so much. And I was like, Greg's never ridden 150 miles in a day. Surely if I keep doing this in back-to-back -back days, he's not going to be able to do it. Right. He's going to cry uncle. I'm going to beat him. And I was like amazed and excited for them and surprised by how they kept pulling out what you know, like, they kept doing it. They kept one up in me from right in front of me. Um, but that was super fun racing with them and like trying to figure out what they could and couldn't do and trying to figure yeah. out what I could and couldn't do. Yeah. It's good to have a carrot out there, something to keep yeah. you uh, motivated and like engaged in like the activity. How long did you have from the end of the wheel race to the beginning of big sky? I think around six weeks. Okay. Yeah. Good. And so I did you a actually lot had... of sofa time. Yeah. I had a good recovery block. <laughs> so and did you do any the other thing? Like, I really believe that, uh, people that like, you know, for the wheel race, for example, you know, when you're doing it for a month, you're in a calorie deficit every day. Yeah. I intentionally showed up a little fatter than I like to be 
knowing that I was going to lose that. And when I got home, I started eating ice cream and laying on the sofa very intentionally in order to get that body fat back up. So I was ready to, to tap those reserves again. Um, yeah. You just can't eat enough to keep up with the energy demands of racing like that. That's one of the advantages of doing with these. You get to come home and eat whatever you want and feel totally fine about it. You can kind of yeah, like, I love it. I'm going to have two breakfasts this morning. Exactly. I love having multiple breakfasts. Yeah. That's my favorite meal of the day. Bring it on. So, uh, do you know how many years the big sky spectacular has been going on? Cause again, this is another race that I've, I haven't heard of. I'm going to say in the ballpark of five. I think that's right. I was poking I know around here for the Odyssey, but I'm not sure for big sky. Yeah, it's interesting. Montana has two uh, big ultra races. They have the Big Sky Spectacular on August 19th, which is 900 miles. And then September 3rd, at least uh, these are the dates from this year, you have the Montana Bike Odyssey, which is 1,750 miles. I was wondering, um, since you've ridden both, how does how do they compare? Are they very similar in terms of like terrain and scenery? Or are they much different? I was surprised how different they were. So I would say that the um, Spectacular is generally easier surfaces. You still get a good mix of a lot of time on gravel and various kinds of gravel and sometimes frustrating gravel circumstances. Like that was my first run in with peanut butter mud. And, you know, you, you can get into some some gnarly stuff some on some of it, but it tends to be more reasonably rideable. Um, and I don't remember any of the climbs on it being like really daunting for me. Um, and it spent most of the time in the prairies. So really oh. looking at those just sweeping views in every direction, we went through some forests. There definitely was time in the woods and time up in the mountains and in the woods, but it was a bigger proportion of prairie. The Odyssey uh, had a bigger variety of surface types. There were more times when I felt at the edge of my capability in terms of the surface I was riding on and way more times where I felt daunted by the climbs. Um, you know, just looking at what the computer was saying, it's like, okay, you got, you know, five miles of 6% grade coming up and it's going to be on this loose gravel. And I just don't think I do have that. That doesn't sound reasonable <laughs> at all, but it all worked out. Um, but the Odyssey spends a ton more time in forests. Uh, okay. And it was some of my first experiences with doing big climbs up forested mountains in undeveloped areas. And that is really spectacular to see. Uh, you know, the first time you're like up in, in, you know, on the edge of a mountain, seeing just woods everywhere and seeing the switchbacks that you've been climbing up. It, it was amazing. You're like, I'm out here now. I'm in it. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Here, here we go. This is me now. <laughs> I meant to ask you earlier, uh, what bike are, are, did you ride one, the same bike for all three of these events you did? Yep. What what bike are you on? It is an all city gorilla monsoon. Um, so it's a steel frame bike meant for, you know, it's got a lot of mount points and stuff for bike packing. Uh, I ride it with 650 B by 48. 38 i would say probably 48 millimeter 48 probably i was on slicks this whole time um oh wow which served me mostly well i've now i'm for the next thing i'm writing i'm gonna ride the uh the big lonely course but do it backwards with some friends and we're gonna um surprise all the racers as we pass them in the opposite uh, direction uh surprise so, yeah, so I'm getting some some knobbies for that because that's a lot more single track than the things I've done so far. And that uh, grill monsoon, it's uh, fully rigid. Yes. No suspension. Yeah. I am getting a suspension stem also for this next thing. I think a little bit of a little bit of balance would probably help me out. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering. I was looking at the pictures. I was like, I think she's running a fully rigid uh, steel bike. Um, yep. and yeah, I noticed that you had slicks on there. So yeah, I was curious, like how that bike performed, um, you know, for those three events and, and if you were going to make any changes then it sounds like you might be. Yeah, I'm definitely going to make some changes. It's tough. Cause I, that is the bike that I've ridden. You know what I mean? Like that's the bike that I know how it feels and I don't have enough experience on other setups to know 
their strengths and weaknesses compared to my setup. Mm. All I know is that my setup feels good and it's what's worked for me. Um, right. I did a lot of like interrogating people before the wheel race to see if I needed knobbies. And the consensus seemed to be that I could get away with slicks. And I was like, well, this is what I know how to ride. So this is what I've got. Um, yeah. So I think the, the suspension stem seems really interesting. A lot of people like them and yeah. I'm going to have one now and I'll see how I like it. Uh, and yeah. Gonna try did out did you find well. that your body was getting beat up from all the jostling on a fully rigid bike? I mean, I would, I like, I would want suspension on the front. That's just me. But there's uh, times where I feel a little beat up. Like certain descents seem real jackhammery, and like it's even gotten so bad that I'm like having a hard time keeping my eyes on the road because the bounce is is going all the way through my neck, yeah, and like yeah. I have to slow down just to make sure I can still safely drive the bike. I never ended up with any kind of hand problems. You know, like the skin on the hands has done well. Numbness is a very limited issue for me. Um, so I, it seems like it works. I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, your body will be your guide, I think. The reason yeah. why I lean towards suspension is because I, I get a lot of um, numbness in the hands and, you know, fatigue through upper body and stuff. And so... For me, it's not really a, uh, it's not a handling component. It's more just like comfortable on the yeah. bike and trying to mitigate some of the, the impact of the road surface and stuff as it reverberates through my body. But yeah, it sounds like your body holds up impressively well, which, uh, which is great. <laughs> yeah. I feel really lucky about that. So, I mean, you know, on the plus side, you know, a sus suspension fork is going to create a lot more weight. Um, so if you can ride fully rigid, and you feel comfortable on that, then you're saving yourself a few pounds of weight on the bike. So, I mean, it has, it definitely has its own benefits because you're going to get fatigued carrying that extra three pounds around for 1700 miles. So, you know, it's all just a, uh, you know, figuring out what works for you essentially. Yeah. So you finished big sky and had no plans to do MBO and then decided to do it. Is that what, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's right. And how many days after Big Sky was MBO? So I think I finished Big Sky on Monday, drove home on Tuesday, and then on Thursday, I saw the Instagram post saying five days till we start. And I was like, oh, what's this? Should I try it? And by Friday, I had decided that I was going to do it. Um, and then I scrambled around Friday, Saturday, Sunday, finalizing my new equipment choices, and then drove back to Bozeman on Monday and took off on Tuesday. Wow. So it was a one week turnaround. What informed that decision? Um, yeah. Yeah. What, um, what... <laughs> okay. So due to writing with my friend, Justin, like we didn't, we wrote it kind of party pace. Like we were having a really good time just like visiting and getting to know each other. And we, we, we rode big days, but I didn't feel like I was really racing or that I was putting myself through any kind of grueling test or anything. I was just having a good time riding bikes with my friend. Okay. Um, and when I got home, I realized that I still wanted more adventure and I also wanted to test that competitive side more. Hmm. Um, I wanted to see what would happen if I went out from the beginning willing to sleep four to six hours a night instead of six to eight and, you know, willing to try to make more of my resupply be gas stations rather than sit down meals. You know, I just kind of wanted, I still felt like there's something I hadn't tested in me. And I also felt like I wasn't ready to, to say goodbye to the season in the summer and, you know, only ride my local loops. I love my local loops. I got, I live in a beautiful place, but yeah. It's real different to ride a place you've been before and to ride into the unknown and wake up in a different place every day and not know what you're going to be in for. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say that both the competitive and the adventure side just felt a little, a little not full yet. And I decided to give it a shot. <laughs> Wild. Um, are you growing in confidence as you go along, like signing up for MBO or are you just, yeah. Are you like, Holy crap, I'm actually doing this. Like, go ahead. Yeah, I'm growing in confidence <laughs> massively. Um, cause I always felt like I was kind of behind the curve as a cyclist. Cause I got good at biking far quick, you know, that I did not feel bad at biking far, 
but all the rest of it about equipment and maintenance and you know navigating through wilderness places i felt really underprepared for but by the time i got around to the, the odyssey like i felt prepared i felt like i knew what was going on you know i know how to turn my devices on and off and keep them charged and <laughs> i know what my favorite gas station foods are and i, I know how to do this now and i felt yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm really like the imposter syndrome is really evaporating and I'm coming to understand that I'm, a, a you know, an intermediate bike pack racer. I know how to do it. Yeah, you keep I mean, it seems like you're further along than in I mean, your results would indicate that I mean, you might be in terms of experience an intermediate level bike pack racer, but your results are indicating, you know, a seasoned pro. So it's really interesting how quickly I mean, you're really that, I mean, you're answering the question, right? You're asking the question, can I do this? And the answer that you're getting back is like, yes, I can. And actually I'm pretty good at this kind of stuff. And you're learning yeah. all this stuff in real time. So that's gotta be like really exciting, really it's addicting fantastic. too, probably. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, it feels amazing to start trying something and dipping my toe in it and just have, keep having good, good, good answers, right? Good experiences, good results. Like it's been an incredible summer. Yeah. And learning like how tough and resilient and capable you are. Like you, nobody knows until they go and you're like finding out in real time. You're like, holy shit, I can yeah. actually do I'm this. Tough. I can. Yeah, I can. So how did, yeah. How did you use that uh, as a springboard into MBO, like how did that inform any goals that you set? What was your mindset kind of going into the Montana bike odyssey? I would say that my mindset was one of, you know, in all of these things I've, I've, my main question has been like, what am I capable of? And I learned from the other ones how I could, you know, push back on sleep and sleep less and eat worse foods and still feel good and capable and able to ride. Yeah. Um, and I learned from the spectacular how much more warm clothing and bedding I wanted in order to feel really good about sleeping outside. Um, and so I showed up for the Montana bike odyssey feeling like, you know, I don't know. I knew the course less than I knew either of the other ones. I had done very little homework on the course um, but I had the notes on the course and I felt confident that I'd be able to figure it out day by day. And I felt like I have the right tools for this. I know how to do this. And I'm interested in figuring out just how, just how hard I can push. Like how can I string together weeks of limited sleep? Um, yeah. you know, how, how does this play out? Like, can I, am I going to find my breaking point by keeping pressing into this or am I going to just do it? And I more or less just did it. I did have a spa day in the middle because um, <laughs> the day I slept in whitefish, I had to sleep outside in whitefish because I was, I came to town like so excited for a hotel room. They had 20 hotels on Google. I was sure I was going to find a room. And then as, when I got to town, I realized that there was a concert of some kind. I still don't know what the concert was. Everything in town was booked. The uh, RV and tent sites in town were booked. Um, people were saying, oh, I could go onto the state park. I didn't find out if the state park was booked. I just came to the city park um, underneath some slides and the cops woke me up in the middle of the night and I had to explain myself to them and they were satisfied with my explanation and left me to finish off my night of sleep there. Uh, <laughs> so then from there, I had like errands in the morning. I had to get breakfast. I had to go to the bike shop. Uh, I needed my brakes and uh, shifter cables adjusted. And... Uh, um, it was only like a 40 or 50 mile day to get to Big Fork, which was the next town. But the town after that, the next stop after that was going to be 100 miles of gravel with like 8 to 10K feet of climb to get to the next services. And I studied, Graham, put, Graham Goff, the race director, did an incredible job of um, like on the full route ride with GPS file. He had, it was just completely peppered with information about stops and things along the way. So like he was noting water sources, he was noting pit toilets in case you wanted those for shelter. Um, so there was like some kind of campground with pit toilets, like 75 miles in, but the prospect of leaving this like cozy real civilization place in poor weather, it was drizzling then with possible thunderstorms coming in at overnight to go on some insane, like hundred mile, night push through unknown gravel hills with no services at all. 
I just didn't like it. And so I stayed, I spent, I think 14 hours in Big Fork. I went to the grocery store. I took an incredibly long bath. Like I ate a ton of food and just rested really good. So I kind of had like a half day off in the middle there. Where'd you get a bath? I thought you said all the hotels were booked. Oh, in Big Fork, they were not all booked. So I left from oh, that was the from next like having town. a haggard night in the city park where it was kind of drizzling and the cops were shining the light in my eyes. And I made it under 50 miles to Big Fork. And I said, here, I'm going to stay here. <laughs> so okay. I, yeah, yeah. I yeah, earned I think this. I got into town at <laughs> two and left at four in the morning. So that was the only time that you kind of stay, stepped out of like racer mode and, and just gave yourself yeah, just, a little bit of a break halfway through or somewhere yeah, exactly. in the middle. Yeah, the timing worked out well. Where like the weather was not great for making the the next push, and it was a, I was I was tired and ready to take more care of myself, and so it was a good day yeah. off. Yeah, you earned it. You had you had a big summer. I wanted to ask you about that interaction with the police officer at twelve thirty in the morning. Um, yeah, I wrote I wrote some notes. You you had a couple interesting sleep experiences, but yeah, so you like rode into town, all the hotels were booked, and you set up just in a city park. Like what what was the city park like that you set up? Was it like just in the middle yeah. of town? It, it's, <laughs> you it's just a pitched pretty a tent? Big, pretty big city park, kind of just in the middle of town. It had a lot of playground stuff there, and it did have a big picnic shelter um, that was appealing because of the rain, but the picnic shelter was well lit and was right on a major road. And so I was like, you know what? That's not for me because I'm sure people are going to call the cops on me. It's a really like nice resort town. Things are expensive yeah. there that people take their pride in their town and they're not going to want some hobo. E even yeah. though she might be a bike pack racer, I was still a hobo that night. Um, yeah. They don't know the difference. Park, yeah. Right. And so I explored around and I found that there were some slides in the playground area that provided just enough rain protection for me to lay my bivy out underneath them and have my bike mostly covered by them. Um, and that was like tucked up, you know, harder for people to see. And so I, I went to bed, like I had prepared all my things to say to the cops if they should come. And I went to bed okay. kind of hoping and thinking that maybe no one would notice me back there. They came and shined the light on me at midnight or one. And, um, you know, I give them my ID. I wear glasses. I'm wearing contacts right now. So my glass, like I didn't have my glasses and I'm just like squinting up at this flashlight. I can't see these people's faces. Um, and they're asking me about who I am and what my deal is. And I'm like, listen, I came to town. I had decided I was willing to spend up to $300 on a room in your town. Everything was booked. I couldn't, I couldn't find another place to sleep. I rode a hundred miles to get here. I'm about to ride a hundred more. I couldn't, I couldn't go down the road. You know, I've got my alarm set for five. I'll be out of your, out of your place promptly, you know? And they said, actually, we got called because some, did you see anybody else around here? I was like, no. And they were like, well, we got a call that somebody else was trying to sleep inside the bathrooms in the park. So that's why we're here. And while we were looking around, we noticed you, you know? And Interesting. so, yeah. So I felt like kind of proud that I had probably been stealthy enough and it was someone else who screwed me. Um, and there were sprinklers that were going on intermittently and it was drizzling rain and, the sprinklers started going off on the cops and they were like, aren't you getting soaked here? And I was like, no, the slide gives me pretty good cover. And then the sprinkler like comes around and blasts them and they have to like take a bunch of steps back. <laughs> uh, and it, it was just a funny scene where I had set up well and they didn't. Yeah. Um, but they were, they were, everything was fine with them. It made me a little nervous when they started like calling my name from my ID into the radio. You know, it just feels like, Oh shit. Am I getting a ticket? Am I getting in trouble? But I think they just wanted to make sure I wasn't like a repeat offender, local vagrant and that my mm. story about just passing through was true. Um, and they yeah. also pointed out, they were like, well, she's better off here than she is getting on the road with all the drunks at this hour. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. That is so nice of them. I'm so glad that they uh, let you stay and they, cause I, I've been in a, not that exact same situation, but I've been in situations where, you know, you're in the middle of doing something that, the rest of the world doesn't even know is a real sport and you're trying right. to explain to lay people like what you're doing and no, I'm not a crazy person. And you know, it's like, that's always a really interesting conversation to have. And I can only imagine it being stressful at 1230 in the morning when you know you're illegally camped and someone is shining a light on your tent and you're getting woken up and you all of a sudden have to, explain this dynamic situation to strangers especially police officers like that had to be the pucker level there had to be pretty high 
It was, but I had I had rehearsed my facts, right? Like the fact that the town was 100% sold out of accommodations was really yeah. strongly in my favor. Like, what do you want me to do, cops? I wanted to be inside. It just yeah. wasn't possible tonight. <laughs> I um, love that and you I had also, your dissertation ready for him. Oh, yeah. I think it's always good to take an apologetic tone immediately in those interactions. You know, right. so I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I really tried and this was the best answer I could find. It's, it was late when I got to town. There was no room available. Um, yeah, because I, I definitely get social anxiety and having like a script in my mind helps yeah. me be ready for any of those kind of interactions. Yeah, I think that's a great pro tip. If you're going to sleep somewhere illegally or questionable, maybe just rehearse, you know, what yeah, you would say. Yeah, why am I here? Were... What am I doing? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'll be right out of your hair. You know, I had set my alarm for this. You know, it, it would be great if I could just get a couple more hours of sleep. But I understand if you need me to move. Yeah. 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 No, especially. Yeah. You're I mean, you're a, you're a guest in their hometown. So enter that with, you know, that dynamic and that perspective in mind. And, you know, yeah. you're just passing through. So you had another interesting sleep experience I wanted to ask you about. Um, it, it sounded like you pitched your tent, got all set up for bed and you heard uh, sticks snapping in the forest and a big Pla splash in the river or pond that you were sleeping next to and you hightailed it out of there. So what happened and like, what, what was it that you were afraid of? This was uh, on the Clark Fork river. I pushed on out of Missoula. You know, Missoula is obviously a town that had a ton of accommodations available, but I kind of just didn't feel ready to be done with the day. It was still early and I wanted to ride further. So I kept on riding with the general plan of making it to Alberton, which I knew had a high school with a field that I could probably set up camp in a like sort of close to civilization place. Hmm. And I was writing and I was just getting really tired. And I was like, I don't want to go all that way. And I found kind of like a wide shoulder spot on this dirt road. No one, I, there had been zero traffic in either direction on this road for the hour and a half or two hours that I had been on it. So I felt like cars won't get me, you know, I can be out of the way of the cars and I'll just, set up here and finish, you know, do more in the morning, right? I'm tired. I'm over it. So I set up camp and put my bike far away from me and had my bear spray with me in bed, you know, <laughs> and I was like, had finished doing my write up and turn, you know, getting all my pictures posted and I was ready to start trying to shut it down mentally. And that's when I heard sticks breaking and it was some kind of creature walking in the woods. I thought probably a deer, right? Like there's no reason to be freaked out about, the sound of a large creature moving through the woods because th that's normal. Um, and then it was, I was right by the river and I didn't even realize how close I was to the river because I had gotten there in night. Um, but very close by, uh, some big mass entered the river. I heard like a plonk, like the water sound of something sizable going into the river. And now I just wasn't sleepy anymore. I didn't know what those creatures were. And I didn't know how realistic it was or wasn't for there to be a bear. I had had dinner with a friend in Missoula who told me that the grizzlies weren't crossing to the south side of the river. So that was part of my feeling safe in setting up on the south side of the river. I was like, well, at least there's no grizzlies here. But now I just wasn't sure about any of it. And I just did not know what that creature was. And it is it was probably like a freaking beaver. You know, I mean, it was probably something completely innocuous. But just in that moment, I was no longer at all sleepy. And it was clear to me that it would be stupid to just keep laying down in this ditch. Like, for what? I'm not sleepy. I'm scared. Like, let's okay. get on the bike and make some progress and get to a place where we can feel safe enough to be able to rest again. Um, so that's what I did. And it was it was kind of tough because um, in Montana, uh, weed is legal. Marijuana is legal. And I had, as part of my unwinding process, I had taken just five milligrams of THC gummy as kind of a sleep aid. And so this was my first time riding on any weed at all. And I didn't love it. It was, you know, I was like kind of haggard and over the day and it's night. And now I've got weed in my system that I don't want in my system for this ride. Um, so it's kind of like a haggard, bleary eyed, slightly stoned ride into Alberton. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that'll just kind of accentuate any fears potentially. Like what's that in the woods? What yep. was that? everything you know you just become so much more in tune uh when you're on weed typically so that's yeah. why you're always afraid the cops are going to come to your door or something like right. you just start envisioning all these things uh that that could happen especially if that was your first time i imagine that was even trippier you're already like sleep deprived and you know yeah kind I'm of scared on the of verge. the woods and now 
<laughs> no, you get to have a bonus two-hour ordeal of riding through it for a, for a while, but oh, that was fine. Man. So you mentioned that, like, I think you said like eighty to eighty-five percent of the time, you're just having like a good time. You're in a mental good headspace. What were some of the challenges, like, for you personally? What What did you find to be challenging about the Montana Bike Odyssey in particular? By far, the hardest thing was going up Fleecer Ridge. Yeah. So that's on tour divide too. That's that yeah. one's infamous. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I didn't know what I was getting in for. I hadn't really studied it. Um, and I, I went up like this really short pitch of really steep stuff on the way there, like a really short pitch, 15 feet. And it was hard to like get my feet to, to grab and to drag the bike up. That was hard. And then I came around the corner and saw Fleecer Ridge and realized that I was in for a quarter mile of something that I could barely do for 15 feet. And I really thought that it was not going to be possible. Um, but I didn't want, like, what are my options, right? Like, do I ride back into Wise River and just say no? <laughs> like, yeah. just say I gave up? Do I, I mean, obviously it'd be ridiculous to push the SOS button. I'm not in danger. I'm fully, ca- I've got a bike and I'm capable of riding it. I just don't know if I could get it the direction I'm trying to get it right now. <laughs> um, and it was a crazy scene there. There was uh, three motorcyclists had passed me with like fully loaded touring motorcycle, like off-road motorcycles that were riding the Continental Divide. And they had failed to get up pre- Fleecer Ridge the previous year and were back to try to get it this year. And oh, when wow. I pulled up to the ridge, they were, uh, two of them were up out of sight. And the one that was still down was on the walkie talkies with them and was like, yeah, my, I got my buddy put it down in the middle of the road. Like he's there in the middle of the road. He's fine. But you know, I can't take my turn until they clear him out. Like, I guess we're not going to get up it this year either. And a guy in a four wheeler came and offered me a ride up. And I was like, I can't, you know, I'm on a race. I have to try. Um, and so I just kind of started pushing and I realized later I should have shuttled. It was stupid for me to leave my bike fully loaded and try to get it all done in one trip. I should have shuttled and I should have probably dumped some water. I probably had more water than I needed at that time. So when you're saying shuttling, you're saying take, like, take your gear off your bike. Yeah. Take the gear off the bike, like drag it up in one go, Uh you know, and then drag the bike up separately would have been a lot easier than what I did, which was to just force the fully loaded bike up the hill with me. Um, but it was incredibly slow going and it, I, you know, I, that was just like jumping into the complete unknown because I looked at it and I did not think I could do it. But the, the, the choice that seemed the most right to me was to try anyway. So I'm just like taking a few steps at a time and resting and looking at like how slowly I'm making progress up this thing so it's challenging because it's steep loose and at high elevation yeah i don't think the elevation is a problem for me i live at 7k so most of the elevation on these things yeah yeah i've I've got that part given to me um but yeah it's super steep and loose and so i wasn't even in the main track I was kind of in the sagebrush off the main track because I felt like I could get better footholds there because at least then I could plant my foot against like a little clump of vegetation and know that it's not going to slide out underneath me. I I fell over twice like when I was in the main path, just losing footing and kind of buckling. Um, And my bike is heavy. Uh, It's steel and I've never been that careful about trying to reduce its weight um, because most of the time it's not that punishing, but it was very punishing here. Yeah, you felt it. Was that time or did you have any other times on MBO where you felt like you had reached your end point? Did you ever feel like, okay, I'm I'm out of out of my element. I don't think I can do this. Did you ever like reach that low of a point? I think that was the the closest I felt to not being able to complete. Um I had some times where like uh, there were a couple of times where I was really looking forward to sleeping indoors and didn't get the indoors sleep and was like, Oh, yeah, that's tough. You know, that's a mental punch in the face. There's no shower. There's no chocolate milk. There's just me in the ditch with my bike foods. Great. Yeah. The thing that um, you've been looking forward to the entire day, maybe for multiple days is yeah. all of a sudden not available to you. That is one of the worst feelings. Yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, I, I, the rest of the time, I had lows where I was really tired, but I never had anything that I didn't think was just a tired and hungry and thirsty problem. You know, like 
I'm deep into the day. I need to make sure that I'm eating and drinking and, and resting enough. But other than that, I'm fine. I mean, the yeah. rest of the time, I really felt fine. There were some times where I got anxious about what was on the course ahead. Um, just like, like, especially that time in, uh, in Big Fork when I had the spa day, you know, 100 miles between services is a lot. And when it's got two giant gravel climbs and descents, that can mean a lot of things. There was, I can't remember the name of the ridge. I can, I could look up in my pictures. I know which pictures were this place and those have uh, location tags on them. But I had been previously on like a forest service road where the climb was pretty much okay. And then the descent was rough enough that I was walking pieces of the descent and just definitely not like making up time during the descent, right? The descent was technical enough and I was nervous enough that I just was crawling down it. And so looking at the facts of the climb and descent in rainy weather, you know, if this stuff is technical, like, am I even capable of this? Is this going to be fine? I got pretty anxious about it before I was there, but then once I was there, it was so beautiful. And those roads turned out much better anyway. Like those roads were fine. There was not the technical aspect that I was afraid of. Um, but you know, when I'm in a beautiful forest, like I'm just not that mad. <laughs> I'm just not that mad and not that scared unless it's a bear problem. Do you have anything in your mental toolkit that you use to, you know, pick yourself back up and keep going when you are scared, you're worried, you're feeling overwhelmed by the experience? Yeah. And it's, it's that scan of like, what are my actual needs in this moment? Am I feeling overwhelmed because I'm actually hungry? Am I feeling overwhelmed because I'm exhausted and a 20 minute ditch nap might give me a new perspective on this situation? Am I right. feeling overwhelmed because I'm lonely? That's kind of one of the times when your podcast or other podcasts come in rather than music. You know, music is great when I'm feeling good, but when I'm feeling really lonely, you know, that was actually one of the, the challenges for this, for the Montana Bike Odyssey. I spent more time outside of cell reception than I had on any of the other experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And just realizing, like, I couldn't just call up my people and have a friendly voice in my ear. But I have a phone with lots of things downloaded to it, and those are lots of friendly voices for my ear. Um, but just, I would say that that's the, 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 that my tool for those challenging times is to scan, like, what are my actual needs in this moment? Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Do I need chapstick? You know, have I not stretched in a long time and, and my body's getting really uncomfortable? You know, do I need to just take a break and, and stand for a while? And, you know, do I need a nap? Like, what are my actual needs that I can do something about? Because I can't do yeah. anything about the fact that I'm biking up this mountain at night. That's going to stay the same. But right. but do I have other problems that I'm neglecting that could make my overall experience a lot better than it is right now? Yeah, I love that. That's such a good perspective. Is just, you know, you're on a big, big journey, um, but getting granular and just talking to yourself and being like, what do I need right now? What's the problem? And how can I fix yeah. it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. One of the interesting things about MBO and uh, and even like Big Sky is how few people uh, do it. So you mentioned MBO is on its fifth year. And um, like I went back and tried to look. Actually, I actually have the numbers. Like 2021, they had three riders. 2022, they had five riders. 2023, I couldn't find any information. And then this year, they only had four people that signed up. Why do you think that uh, why do you think that participation is so low? Do you have any idea? I think that the idea of an epic quest is a lot more appealing to a lot of people than the nitty gritty of doing the training and getting the equipment and showing up ready. And I think because actually there were a lot more people registered when I first made the decision to register. I was looking on bikereg.com mm -hmm. for the MBO. And then there was like 12, 15 names in there. I was like, sweet, oh, you know, I'm going to wow. find people to ride. With you. This could be a party. But yeah. many of those people had changed their mind between January when they made that commitment and, you know, September when it was time to show up at the starting line. And I yeah. think, I think it's because life gets in the way. I mean, I am so lucky to be able to put work down for a year and really just dedicate myself to riding bikes. It takes so many hours to feel really confident that you have something like a 1700 mile ride in you, yeah. you know, it, 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 I am extremely blessed to be in that position that I knew that I could do that. And I think, I think hesitation about taking on such a big goal, especially 
in the context of lives that are often busy with work life and family life and so many commitments that make it hard to get 30 hours a week on your bike. Um, I think it's just, it, it's a big, it's a big goal. And I think not a lot of people feel ready for it. I wonder if like the low participation is a part of like one of the contributing factors, because I think it's kind of easier to hold yourself accountable and to like feel comfortable doing it when there's 50, a hundred, 200 other riders that are also out there, you know, but like for you, when you did it, there was you and three other people. So it, it kind of, it seems like it feels even bigger when there's such a small field, you know? That's so funny. Cause I feel almost the opposite about that. Um, oh yeah. Because, uh, first of all, like to the extent that I have competitive drive in these things and that I want to do well in the field, the bigger the field, the more people there are that can beat me and beat me by huge margins. Um, also, so much of my joy comes from being alone in the wilderness. And when you get yeah. the big field, you're going to spend a lot less of your time alone in the wilderness. Yeah. I have kind of mixed feelings about the tour divide for that reason that, you know, it, it, the route is very interesting. I used to be afraid that I wasn't up for the route. Now I think I am up for the route. I think I could do it. Um, but do I want to do it in a big mass start of over 200 people? Like, yeah, that's such a different proposal. And I guess, yeah, it, it does take away that sense of isolation and gives you more confidence that someone would come by if you're having some kind of problem. But honestly, on most of these roads that I was on for the Odyssey and for the Spectacular, there was a very small trickle of traffic. I would estimate that if I didn't have the inReach, you know, probably within 12 hours, certainly within 24, a car would come by. And I could flag them down, right? I've got a broken collarbone or whatever it is, like whatever has happened that I'm not able to continue riding my bike. Yeah. You know, I have food and I have emergency shelter and water. I can survive for a while. And so I, I guess I, I feel like most of the places that I went weren't so remote that I would never see a person if I had an emergency. Yeah. I, I think I lean more to your side. Like, um, I, I enjoy more the solidarity, a solitarity, solitude, being alone, whatever that word is. What is it? Solitude. Solitude. Thank you. I enjoy more the solitude and the idea of, uh, there being a bunch of people in the, in the field kind of intimidates me a little bit, but for a lot of people, I think there's, there's a comfortable factor there. You won't be as lonely. You'll have people to talk to, you know, safety being, um, one of the factors, but yeah, I, uh, I want, uh, let's see if we can help, uh, get more people registered next year. Um, so what were some of the highlights? What were some of your favorite parts? I mean, you went back to Montana twice this year because riding through it, you had such a good time. So let's help their registration numbers. What were some yeah. of the highlights of your Montana experiences this summer? Okay, you're going to be on gravel roads, excellent surfaces, easy to ride on. You're going to be looking around you in every direction and see the horizon on every side. You're going to see mountains out on that horizon. You're going to see tons of pronghorn and whitetail deer and mule deer. You might see some bears. I saw five on the Odyssey. Uh, you're going to go up and down mountains that you didn't know existed and see things there that you didn't know you could see. You know, like every mountain, every big climb I did on the Odyssey was my new favorite mountain. Like I was like losing <laughs> my shit every time I got up to the top. <laughs> this was so cool. This is better than the other ones. You're like, this um, one's my favorite. No, this one's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're going to just see landscapes that are, mm, you've only seen these things in pictures. You've never imagined yourself being able to move through those landscapes and, and string together you know, an epic trip that takes you through that land and you get to see it moving around you and changing slowly. You know, Montana has incredible, uh, I guess, geography would be my word for this, but um, the different kinds of mountain forms and the different kinds of rock outcroppings and just there's so many different landscapes that you're going to move through and it's going to keep surprising you as this just this beautiful alien vista that you get to be involved in. Um, the people of Montana are incredibly warm and friendly. Like when you pull into small, the bar and this, you know, like the one business in the small town, Montana, and you park your bike outside and 
mosey up to the bar. Like if you want to meet people and have conversations about your crazy quest and gets to feel that kind of slice of life and like what these people's lives are like and what their perspective on your activity is like, that's available. The people are there and they're ready to talk. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, very... it's not a highly populated state, so they probably get excited when they meet yeah. someone new. They're like, whoa, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who are you? What are you about? Um, yeah. yeah. So for me, the highlights are that landscape, like all of those landscapes, so many different landscapes, different kinds of forests, different kinds of mountains, different kinds of rock outcroppings and prairie view. Uh, and I love wildlife and I love seeing all the different wildlife and uh, you know, I saw just a ton of it. Um, you know, when you were talking about with the Iceland race that, you know, it's sad to move through some of the beautiful vistas at night. Some of the coolest wildlife stuff has happened for me at dusk or after dark where, you know, yeah. seeing like a beautiful stag with his antlers kind of illuminated by the very last pieces of the setting sun. It's incredibly beautiful. And yeah he's probably around somewhere in the day. I might see him in the day, but to see that like with just the last little bits of light of the day is especially magical. Oh yeah. Way um, more, uh, wildlife going on in, you know, in the evening and at nighttime and stuff. A lot of times during the day they're bedded down. Yeah. Waiting out the heat. I got a kick out of this. So if you read Montana Bikes Odyssey's website on their homepage, they're describing the course and they say uh, that it's mostly welcoming ranching and farming communities. Mostly welcoming. <laughs> I got a I got a chuckle out of that. So I had to um I mean it sounds like you had a great experience with the locals. Was it Absolutely. mostly welcoming or was it woefully welcoming or whole all the it was wholly welcoming. welcoming. It was wholly welcoming. Yeah. <laughs> um, the the closest I got to any kind of bad vibe was just like some places people weren't striking up conversations with me, which is just fine. Like I don't, I don't require socializing with all these people all the time. It's fine. Um, yeah. I did not see anything non welcoming, uh, but I think it was Graham at his pre race meeting was explaining that some people come in with a race mentality and forget that that's a, that's a world that only exists in their head and that that's mm -hmm. not the world that the people that you come across are living in. So yeah. there were rumors of people in some context, I don't know whether it was on this course or elsewhere, you know, coming into the small town and being like, well, why isn't my food ready yet? You know, I got to go. Yeah. And I don't, I don't have that attitude at all. Like when I get off the bike and go to the bar to eat, I am now in the bar and I'm on bar time. You know, and I'll, yeah. I'll still try to get myself back on the bike in a reasonable fashion, but I, I do not have any sense of like imposing my urgency on the people around me. Um, and I would guess that that might have been what led to not entirely welcoming environments if someone was yeah. coming in, acting like they were the most important person in the room when they were just a random tourist passing through with some bizarre, unexplained sense of urgency. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true anywhere you go. And that is what I was talking about earlier about you're a guest in their in their hometown and, you yeah. know, and they don't have any perspective of what you're doing. I host my own races in Texas and um, we've had some incidences like that with people who are in race mode and that mentality and they come into X, Y or Z place and they're like, their expectations are out of sync with the the timing and the environment that they're in. And, you know, that's not really fair to those locals that have no idea what you're doing. You know, I mean, that is right. part of the race experience on these, you know, multi-day adventures is you're going to be subject to the ebbs and flows uh, of the event, you know, and that is part of it. And it's, it's the same for everybody who does it, you know? Yeah. And I also, I always try, anytime I'm having a sit down meal, I try to drink a bunch of soda at the sit down meal. So like it's valuable time too. like time off the bike, looking in your phone or looking around right. the room and having conversations. That's a valuable kind of refill for me too. And so why am I in such a hurry to leave this thing? Like this is good. This is recovery. This is a part of doing well at going fast is going slow sometimes and taking a load off. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Anytime you're doing ultra racing or anything like you can always utilize that time for something, you know, you can be researching the next section or organizing your gear or charging your electronics or yep. stretching. I mean, there's 
a hundred different things that you can be doing. And so it's really smart to just take advantage of that time. If things are going slow, wash your bike, lube your chain, you know, I mean, there's so many yeah. things that you can be doing with that time. So, all right, let's, uh, I wanted to conclude by talking about the three events. So, um, what was your favorite event that you did this summer and why? Uh oh, your eyes are big. That's a tough question. They're all good. They're all good. Let's just they're all good. Let's just um, say that. Which one did you enjoy the most though? And I think it comes down to like it's not like saying, okay, this event is better than that event. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. everybody enjoys different things, right? And that's why options are great. We're all different human beings and different things are gonna appeal to us, you know? Yeah. I'll give you an answer. It might not be the best answer. It might I might change my mind in a few days, but um the second half of the wheel race was my favorite because that's where I started to realize that I could race and that I could do it successfully and that compromising mm -hmm. sleep and food were acceptable and left me okay. And that I, and you know, the fun of being in that chase with those guys and like trying to figure out how I could get ahead of them and realizing that I was doing this thing that I had dreamed of that felt like a really far off goal that was too impossible to accomplish. And now here I was and like, it was just happening. I was doing it. I was racing yeah. and it was working. I think that was the funnest because that was what opened the door for me to agree to do the other things and to show up for the mm -hmm. other things. Right. Like realizing that this wasn't just a dream. This was real. Yeah. That really started happening for me, like in the middle of the country on the wheel race. Yeah, that's such a great answer. You're only going to get that opportunity once, really, like, um, that can I do this, this big goal, this big dream, the thing that I've been training of and dreaming of and, you know, being afraid of. And you're like, okay, that realization is like, oh, fuck, I am actually, I'm doing it I'm right here. now. Yeah, I'm this doing is it. it. I'm winning. And I'm, I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll never get to like, you'll keep having to answer that question to different varying degrees, but that first time of like, can I do this and answering? Yes, I can. Um, you'll never get that one again. So that's a great yeah. answer. Which one was the hardest? That one's, uh, the, the best answer for that is the bike odyssey, the Montana bike odyssey. Um, the terrain was harder being, being that remote that much of the time was harder. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, there were three 90 plus mile segments between resupply with non-trivial terrain between them. Like that's serious business. You know, you're carrying a lot of food, you're carrying a lot of water, you're responsible for yourself and out of contact with the rest of the world for a, a, a whole day. <laughs> you know I mean? It's a, it's an it's undertaking. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I would say that that one was the toughest. And the Fleece Ridge was the toughest. I mean, that was very tough. It was a hard time. <laughs> uh, which one are you the most proud of? I think the Bike Odyssey is the one I'm the most proud of, too. Um, because I'm super proud for the wheel race. Like, I, I did so many firsts there. And I really right. grew my comfort zone and figured out what I was able to do. Um, but the, the Odyssey, you know, I showed up and I started laying it out there from the beginning. I started, you know, I was riding as long as I felt I could before I needed rest. I was sleeping as little as I felt I could get away with. I was minimizing restaurant stops and trying to eat gas station food and trying to race efficiently. I was really trying to race. Um, and I did and it worked, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I did it and, and I did a good job of it. Um, yeah. and I'm really proud of that because that feels like it opens so many doors for what I could try to do in the future. Like I am a bike pack racer now and I can go race bike pack races. That's really exciting. Aww. Those things I are love fucking that. awesome. I get to do I love them. that clip. I am a bike pack racer. I love that. That's been the interesting thing about your summer is you went from, you know, can I do it with the wheel race and you did it and you did well. And then your second one you said you went at a little bit more of a party pace touring, having a good time. So you had that experience and then you're like, okay, and now I'm ready to be in racer mode. I want to be in racer mode from the start to the finish and, and see what that's like. And yeah. so it's just been a really big summer of learning and growing and answering all these questions. 
Um, and so that leads into my next question, but like, what did you learn about yourself as a human being? Big question, but what are your biggest takeaways? What did you learn about yourself, um, over the course of this summer? You know, I've always regarded myself as tough, but I got a lot of clarity and details and receipts about the context <laughs> in which I'm tough and exactly how tough I am. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when, when the shit hits the fan, I have like a kind of more, and I've known this for a long time from just different experiences that I get just business minded and like, what can we do to take care of this? You know, you're scared, you're alone, you, you've decided to move camp, you're high, like, what the fuck? It's like, okay, we're just going to talk ourselves down and keep ourselves as happy as we can. We're going to sing loud music that'll scare away the critters. And we only have to go two hours to get to Alberton. A two hour ride is nothing. Like, let's go. Um, you know, I, I, I know that I can rely on myself in time of need. Um, and that's a great yeah, thing to big. know. And I also learned, you know, I've always been kind of shy about my ability to like bike handling and like the, the technical skills of bike riding. I've always felt kind of behind the curve on because I didn't ride bikes a lot growing up. And when I did, I crashed because I didn't ride them a lot. Um, and so I, you know, for the first 35 years of my life, thought of myself as someone who couldn't really ride bikes good. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that's come from having you know, all three of these events have put me in areas where I was a little bit outside of my comfort zone. And I learned that that's how I grow as a bike rider is getting into terrain. that's just a little too tough for me, preferably with friends. That's the best is if I can have other people with me when this happens um, so <laughs> that I see them confidently moving through it. And then I'm just right. like a little more willing to take that step just a little bit outside of what's comfortable and trust it and ride. And the more you do that, the more bike skills you have. And so I've also learned that you know, I've learned, I've gotten stronger as a bike rider and I've also learned what it is, what separates me from the version of me that feels like an awesome, like, you know, a mountain bike or someone who can handle whatever terrain. It's just time. It's time going on things that are a little outside of my comfort zone, preferably with friends who are willing to explain stuff to me. Yeah. The term that's coming to mind, that's not the best term, but you took a crash course, pun not intended, uh, in, this course or this summer in bike pack racing, and you did fucking awesome. I mean, you completed all three events that you entered. You, uh, you came in, yeah, you first female on the first two and first overall at Montana Bike Odyssey. So, I mean, you did freaking amazing and obviously learned and grow a lot on along the way um which just begs the question what is next for you what are you going to do with all this newfound information about who you are as a person and your love for bike pack racing um i know you haven't probably had a lot maybe you haven't <laughs> i was gonna say you haven't had a lot of time to think about it but you've been on your bike a lot maybe you've had a ton of time to think about it landscape <laughs> thinking about what's next I have yeah what more. is next I have two more things going on this season. So Whoa, okay. three weeks is the big lonely out of Bend, Oregon, a 350 mile, 300 mile loop. Um, okay. And I have a bunch of friends from Washington who were too late to register for it. And we've kind of hatched this plan of riding it in reverse and, and showering happiness and joy on the haggard racers as they start to pass us in the other direction. That'll so be a fun experience. That'll be awesome. And that one is one third single track, which is a little outside of my comfort zone. So that's kind of mm. also one of those instances of like, how do I get better? I ride bikes with friends that are, you know, who are better than me at riding bikes and, and the terrain's just a little too tough for me. So I'm really looking forward to that because it'll be a party and it'll hopefully help me grow as a rider of single track. Um, yeah. And then I'm doing the 24 hour time trial in Borrego Springs uh, in early November. Um, so I'm going to ride my bike in circles. I've, I'm getting a time trial bike. I'm working on it right now. I've made a list of ones that are for sale online that fit me. Um, mm -hmm. So I am going to go do something like completely the opposite of all the adventure and just put myself in the box of being on this bike and putting out effort and taking in fuel. I think you'll find the pave cave on that one. We'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll see. <laughs> um, and then... I still don't know what's up for next year. I'm thinking, I'm deciding now that I don't have to decide for a long time, but I'm feeling out whether I want to ride tour divide next year. Is it too crowded? You know, am I too intimidated by a 
deeper field of strong competitors or am I ready to go show up and give it my shot and see what happens? Um, I got my first mountain bike a couple we like right, I guess in between the two events, I acquired my first mountain bike and I took it out for its second ride yesterday. Um, I got a What'd you get? salsa spearfish, okay. um, which I told the shop, you know, I want to be able to ride whatever. I thought I wanted a hardtail, but they said everybody that buys a hardtail ends up coming back wanting a full suspension. So it is full suspension. Um, it is made for bike packing and has as many mount points as you can put on a full suspension bike. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to start riding that on rougher trails around home and learning how, like just trying to grow that, that comfort zone on rough terrain, um, and get it, hit it out and get bags for it so that I can take it bike packing. Uh, I have a project, a personal project where I'm biking from my front door to all of the neighboring States. So I've done. Idaho, Wyoming, and Arizona so far, but Colorado, New Mexico, and Nevada all remain to be done. So those are some like just personal bikepacking projects that I'll be interested in doing. I don't think I'm going to fit any more of those in at the end of this year, but I might, I might still get like Colorado knocked off. You know what might be fun is if you created a route to a bunch of different casinos and like uh, just rode and then gambled and then rode to the next one and gambled and rode to the next one and gambled and like incorporate yeah cycling and your job you could be the first person to ever do I that could be a full-time create... professional bikepacking nomad poker player I yeah really yeah we could call it the gambler's loop or something like that you know you like come up with like a route and other people who i don't know how many bike packers are gamblers but there's got to be some out there that a would think others. that would be I fun a couple yeah yeah that'd be <laughs> a good time <laughs> Well, Jen, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been a blast to talk to you. I think um, you are something. You are the type of person that uh, I love about this community. Is that uh, I, you know, bike packing? I feel like is for anybody, and it seems like big and daunting. Um, but I love that this sport is still so small that you can see someone you know, a few years ago, like get on a bike and get on a bike path and be like, Oh, now I just want to go further. And now I just want to go further and further and further. And I mean, in the last four years, you've grown so much and you're a perfect example of how accessible this very daunting and big sport is. And I love that we have space for that in this sport for anybody to show up at any stage in life and say, this is something that I want to try. And you are, living proof of, of, of that exact thing. And I think it's awesome. And, um, I, I don't also know. just I... want to point out for any shy listeners who are wondering if they can do it, a motel overnight, you barely even need luggage. You yeah. can take your bike as it exists now and go to the motel overnight in good weather and take a shower there and ride home the next day and get breakfast at the motel. Like Absolutely. getting started is really easy. And if you find you like it, then obtain a little bit more luggage, carry a little more next time. You know, you don't have to get all the way into the deep end to be riding the tour divide to start. It's, it's such a great way to get into bike packing. There is no shame in grabbing a hotel. Um, Ustinus that just won the tour divide. He didn't even, uh, go camping, uh, before doing ultras, you know, like he didn't even own a tent. I don't think if I remember correctly. And so yeah. my, and my girlfriend, and I, we're doing a bike packing trip this weekend and we're staying in like a airstream with, you know, air conditioning and all the amenities. And we're going to hardly carry anything on our bikes. It's, it's hot as fuck in Texas. So it's still like slightly too hot for camping and stuff. And so that's a great way to just go and ride your bike and enjoy it. And then you can take a shower, you can sleep in a nice bed, recharge yeah. all your devices, the whole thing, you know, yeah. it's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Camping isn't the fun part for everybody. It's just, most people just want to be on their bike, you know, the whole, the whole time, you know, they just want to ride their bike all day. So yeah. Pro tip. It's for everybody. All right, Jen. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, congratulations on a just wildly successful summer, and I'm excited to see what you do in the future. Thanks, Patrick. It was great talking to you, and I hope everybody listens to this and decides to go ride their bike. Go ride your damn bike. That's right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jen. Have a good one. You too. Bye. 
All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and a big congratulations and shout out go to Jen Kelly on her amazing summer and for coming on the podcast to share her experience. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to uh, watching her dot on future events. She's one to keep an eye on, I think, eh? And coming up on the podcast next week, I am chatting with Hannah Simon. I'm actually headed to Chumba World Headquarters tomorrow in Austin uh, to meet up with Hannah. And we're going to be talking uh, probably mostly about her Silk Road mountain bike race win this year and uh, just catching up with her. Last time we chatted with her uh, was when she completed the Triple Crown in 2024. So it'll be great to check in with her And that is coming for you next week. Until then, it is always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Until next week, you know what to do. Go ride your damn bike.